right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. East Coast Earthquake. Woo! It just happened while we were celebrating. Friday. Holy shiza. They were aiming the earthquake gun at me. <laughs> we celebrated Friday too hard. That was a pretty strong one for the East Coast. This is the consequences of me having the heaviest balls and being right all the time. All right, chat. Wow. Um, am I high or does Mike's mic sound weird? Does it sound weird? I did restart my computer last night. Is it? I might need to adjust some shit. Hold on. Let me look at this. Because Mike, uh, 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 it does feel a little bit loud, huh? Okay, is this better? 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 <clears throat> Uh, okay. Just the last several minutes. Uh, Lisa Rafa is in the CNN Weather Center. And uh, Lisa, I love how they say it's New York. Earthquake. That is. Uh, There's a lot of minutes that they have initially measured the earthquake to be about 4.8 on the Richter scale. Uh, That's we're strong. Right now, uh, trying to scramble. Uh, teams in New right York back. City uh, and the surrounding area, as well as our uh, weather center at Atlanta, uh, to get some folks uh, on camera as soon as they can to talk to us about this. But if you uh, talk to people in the New York uh, City area, uh, you see that there are people who are describing what they felt uh, as, as tremors uh, in just the last several minutes. Uh, Lisa Rafa is in the CNN Weather Center, and uh, Elisa, a 4.8 magnitude earthquake, that is, uh, I mean, that, that's enough for folks to feel it. What can you tell us? It is, and um, it is enough for folks to feel it. And I'm actually from New York, so on my way down to the studio, I called my mom to be like, did you feel it? And she said that you know, my parents are in Staten Island, and she said that she did feel the shaking of the earthquake. Some of her friends even had some China, you know, dishes that were kind of shaking on the shelves and, and kind of falling, too. So, yes, definitely felt in New York City, for sure. 4.8 uh, magnitude on the Richter scale is pretty significant, especially for this area that's not quite that used to earthquakes, right? We had a seven point magnitude earthquake in Taiwan that's in kind of ground zero in the heart of seismic activity where they are used to it. Uh, these people here in New York, I can tell you, are not used to it. So they definitely felt that shaking. Um, the depth is pretty shallow, which is also why people would feel the shaking. All right, Chad, right? I'm the just, I'm just messaging people going, that did you feel down. that? So that's where they're going to feel it oh. as well. Oops. So, yes, uh, right now it also, again, looks like it was in the heart of uh, kind of central New Jersey, nor uh, central New Jersey right there. So, uh, again, felt in New York. Also heard from some family friends that felt it even up into Connecticut as well. Uh, Weird. So no Weird. I don't know why that's not working. That's odd. Okay. <sighs> I guess they have technology. Professional streamer. All right, hold on. Let's go on YouTube.
Generation of Now is NBC News Now. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder... On Eclipse Across America, special coverage begins at 1 p.m. Eastern. The main event starts at 2 p.m., anchored by David Muir and Lindsay Davis right here on ABC. Oh, God. Can you imagine if you were in Pennsylvania back in, like, medieval times or, or early in the colonization, and they had an earthquake, and then they got a full the solar eclipse? <laughs> News Live. That'd be sacrificing and coming up, Dr. Pichel is virgin. back to answer more of your no questions. No member of and DGG would be safe. Kids, he's weighing in with the answer next. Also ahead, police say it's one of the biggest cash heists in L.A.'s history. How the thieves got in and out with $30 million. What does it take? Oh, yeah, did you guys hear about the heist? Did you guys hear about the heist? I mean, it is Friday, chat. And oh my God, chat. Welcome. I didn't even inter I didn't even say hi because the earthquake happened, and I was just I was just like uh, all uh, uh, up in my own ass about it. But Biden tried applied pressure to Israel, and they immediately caved. Oh my God. I told you the vibes were getting better yesterday. Like I get off stream and then Biden told Israel they had to uh, do stuff differently. Wow, and it instantly worked. All those arguments we had with all those liberals and they were instantly proven right. The other thing is apparently Hassan made fun of Hutch. Is this true? I want to watch this is this seems really funny. Can someone please give me the mod because I want to watch that. Hutch deserves to be cooked because he is like Hutch is a video game bro and he is is I mean, listen, I tried my best to be really nice to him, but he's a Democrat partisan. And he has been influenced by some of the dumbest people on the internet and he's not sharp enough to know what bullshit is. Hassan discovered the craft of going through old tweets and proving yourself right. Oh. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh. And it's so funny when people are like, Biden's doing everything he can! Biden's doing everything he can and then Biden like actually does something and then they're like oh see I told you and it's like no idiot I got proved right very slightly he proceeded to backpedal when some chatter said Hutch was sad upset about the comments he then read my comments saying fuck Hutch fuck Hutch liberal dog shit and started to backpedal. I don't think I don't think Hassan likes to have enemies. And who does? Hutch went off the rails and said the uprising at the Warsaw ghetto is a terrible comparison because of Hassan's charter. Is he talking about the charter that had six people cited or the new charter? And what about Likud's charter? What about the... Uh, uh, this is the thing that's actually batshit crazy. You're going to say that the Palestinians deserve to be genocided because they have members of their government that are radically right-wing. And then you have members of Israel who have nuclear weapons and who has the U.S. support and who have killed 30,000 people, mostly children, by targeting family homes, which has now been reported... It's been reported out that Israel is targeting family homes and murdering people when they're home with their families. They're doing family destruction, intentional family destruction.
All right, let's let's make fun of Hutch to start this thing up, and then maybe no we can. No interest in in Israeli lives. Earthquake. Point of those posters in and of itself. Yeah, what happened? What happened? Wait. Posters. Hassan says the real point of these Israeli hostage posters are to trick people into tearing them down so they can be filmed to make Arabs look bad. This dude is really peddling Jewish conspiracy theories like weirdos on the right. Next, he'll be saying Soros paid for them. Huh. There was a lot of other parts from that. Here, this is a this is literally a perfect. By the way, this is a perfect uh, example of how like things get clipped out of context and people fucking yell at me on Twitter over it. Okay. Think. What did I say? I didn't just fucking say those posts are being propped up specifically for that reason. I also followed that up in the longer video that you just saw about how. Israel has no real interest in protecting the hostages because they're blowing them up. Okay? Okay, how that. about this? On I November 5th, 2023. Roasts. Hutch. Okay? And it was valid, or, and it was a correct take. But of course, they clipped it to be like, Hassan is peddling anti-Semitic conspiracies. First of all, uh, it was 100% correct. Everything I said there was 100% correct. And once again, this will be good. Did We're going to indicate. And me. by the way, at chat, the reason why I'm showing you this is because this is the kind of tenor of how conversations are just going everywhere. Whether this is, this isn't about Hutch isn't important enough for me to actually care, but he's emblematic of internet liberals. He's emblematic of internet liberals. He doesn't know shit. He talks really loudly and really condescendingly. He's wrong. And he gets embarrassed if you ever look at the facts. These girls wear short skirts to trick men into raping them. I like how the only way Hassan can convince his audience not to be anti-Semitic is by pelleting an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Hey, man, if it gets the job done. Hassan is turning into the new Alex Jones. Where are they at now? Wait, you Where are you, these motherfuckers okay, you at gave now? The, I mean, Chatter, I love you, but you gave the worst clip ever. You didn't show the context of what Hassan was reacting to. For the funsies. Fuck it. YOLO. Oh my god. I'm about to get so many brand deals. Holy shit. This is where he pulls up Hutch initially. Alright, let's go. Their orbiter who was like losing his mind over it. Uh, being like, dude, he doesn't care. He clearly doesn't care about the hostages. What the fuck? Of those posters in and of itself is not to be like, look at all these uh, children that are lost. The point of these posters, the real point of these posters is so that someone goes and fucking tries to rip it off so they can fucking film it and go, look, look at these scary Arabs. They hate it. They have no interest in, in, in Israeli lives. Point of those posters in and of itself. Yeah, what happened? What happened? Wait. Posters. Hassan says the real point of these Israeli hostage posters is to trick people into tearing them down so they Okay, you're missing the context before this. Oh, for fuck's sake. I have to, I guess I just have to watch VODs now. And I understand why there's like this like narrative in the Jewish community, but like that doesn't make Jews more safe. You know, mm -hmm. it's a failure of a project. And then now we're seeing like this fucking bloody reality. Damn, center left. Center and left the podcaster, center left show. This attack began. We're concerned about 134 uh, hostages. Here's a picture of some of them. These girls are under tunnels for half a year, raped, tortured. This is what we're concerned about. Bro, bro, props. It's like, oh, are you concerned about them? Perhaps you should stop bombing them too, then, because of how horny you are to kill as many Palestinians as possible. It's so. It's so obvious what the fuck the hostages mean for those in power. Okay? It is so obvious. Like, bro, 
you laminated this shit. Go, if you genuinely cared about the hostages, and there are plenty of people who still want to fucking melt Gazans, right, in Israel, but they do care about the hostage lives, they're fucking using every, ener every ounce of energy they have uh, at, at yelling at the Netanyahu war cabinet to stop bombing. They were aiming the earth con earthquake gun at me. Of course I felt it. You very clearly don't care. You don't give a shit about the fucking hostages. Hamas cares more about the fucking hostages than you do. I don't understand because how it's their bargaining getting fired shit. is Not the appropriate response for the murder of seven people. I don't understand how that's the appropriate response. They should be arresting them, not dismissing them. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, Hamas fired their leader for doing October 7th. Okay, we're all back to peace now, I guess, right? Because they care about the humanity. I'm not making that assessment at all. Okay? But there is no greater example. And I said this fucking literally when the hostage posters were propping up. Let me see if I can find that video real quick. This is the context chat. You had this warmonger, and we covered this yesterday, went on to MSNBC and they said, do you care about the civilians, the Palestinian civilians? And he started talking about the hostages and he brought up pictures of hostages. And the, so basically he ignored the idea that there was any civilians or innocent people in Gaza. He said 70% of Palestinians supported October 7th. According to, how do you pull a people where half of them or more than half of them are refugees and the majority of the population are children? Like, what the fuck are you even talking about? Okay, so I think this is when Hassan pulls up the... Uh, the and I the said at the time that they were 100% using that as an opportunity to catch people ripping the hostage posters. This video went viral on... And I said, don't do it. Don't get baited into ripping the hostage posters because they're using it for propaganda. And then people tried to fucking yell at me and say, Hassan... I can't believe you would even suggest that Israel doesn't care about the fucking hostages. I can't believe you said well, that. Yeah, and this, this is actually very important. This is actually a very important point, which is just the hostage posters. Are the hostages in, in New York? Are the hostages in Philly? Are the hostages in Pittsburgh? These are not... You're, why are you putting up missing person posters in an entirely different continent? The answer is so that you can propagandize. It, it has absolutely nothing to do with the, what the purpose of these posters is supposed to be, which is to give the community the uh, ability to recognize a missing person or an exploited person and hopefully recognize them if they come across them on the street. That's the purpose of a, of a missing poster, right? And so what is this? This is a propaganda poster. And notice that these stopped popping up. Why did the hostage poster stop popping up? Because the hostage families hate Netanyahu. The hostage families want a ceasefire because that's the only way they're going to save their family members. The hostage families are furious with the uh, indiscriminate bombardment because it's led to hostage deaths, not Hamas executing them. Hamas hasn't been like, fuck these hostages and started executing them because, out of rage. They have kept those hostages alive. And the main threat to them is not Hamas. It is Israel's indiscriminate bombing. I cannot believe you said that. You're such a fucking piece of shit. I'm pretty sure even Bonarelli had like his fun little moment tweeting about that too, if I recall back then. <laughs> Give him less ammo. It's that simple. This is awesome. Now these girls were literally bombed when they were kids in Lebanon. They were literally bombed in Lebanon by the IDF. Again, 
Again, you need to understand. Stop saying base. Stop saying base in the fucking chat. Oh, God, you guys are so stupid. You're doing it. You're doing the thing. You're doing the exact same thing. There is probably at least 1,000 people in here right now that is screen recording every single fucking person that said base just now to be like, look, Hassan loves it. Hassan hates Israeli babies. Notice how... Hassan didn't immediately and regularly condemn it. It's like, bro, it is so fucking disingenuous to act like you give a single shred of a fuck about Israeli children being held hostage by Hamas right now when the Israeli government that you're defending is blowing up those fucking hostages. It's ridiculous. Oops. Where are the haters now, dude? Where are they at now? I thought, I thought Israel cared about the hostages. It's Go so back funny. to your mic quality it's from so before. It's so funny Wait. that people like Brianna Wu and Destiny are like fully trying to embrace Israel the moment before Joe Biden is like, wow, you guys are going too far. Wow, this is genocidal. Wow, you murdered these uh, aid workers. And then it's so funny how, how, how Destiny went on a debate with Professor Finkelstein and was like, Israel makes sure to precisely target every uh, individual, and it goes through multiple layers. No, it doesn't. They have an AI uh, fucking bot, and they bomb it. They bomb kids. They have an AI called Where's Daddy to make sure that they bomb family homes, because they, uh, eh, eh, which is basically targeting families. And they don't even make sure that the supposed militant, who they don't have direct evidence as a militant, they just have an AI model score, and they bomb people's homes, killing women and children and innocents and neighbors who had absolutely fucking nothing to do with it. And they use dumb bombs. <laughs> Destiny and Betty Morris were like, oh, it's so precise. Oh, it's so carefully targeted. Carefully targeted to kill as many children as possible. The most moral army in the world. Make sure to bomb the family home. Can you imagine if Hamas was just bombing the family homes of IDF soldiers? Can you understand how much the Israeli defenders would be losing their shit? Because, of course, that would be a horrific war crime to kill civilians. And that's, and, and by the way, all of us who have defended Palestinians have condemned Hamas for killing civilians during October 7th. But we have the wisdom to understand that if you have one side that's massively oppressed and dehumanized and denied rights and blockaded, there's going to be an uncontrollable response. It's blowback. And the other side has the support of the world's superpower and is carefully using those bombs to target kids. It's a little bit of a different thing. Wait, why? Is my mic quality not better now? This is better. Get some new takes, bro. At least switch up once. Okay, I'm uh, I'm gonna switch up now because of that chatter. I'm gonna start defending Israel now for the funsies. Fuck it, YOLO. Oh my god, I'm about to get so many brand deals. Holy shit. Anyway. Yeah, debunk my own arguments. Remember remember all those motherfuckers that literally precisely did that, by the way? They were like, Hassan, I think it was Hutch. It must have been. Was it Hutch? It was a bunch of orbiters that literally... Fuck, come on. Where are my, where are my fucking clippers now? I... I Will I Where? go to Janet? Will I cover China? Uh, yeah, Janet Yellen telling China to stop making solar panels so cheap? Yeah. That's incredible. That's fucking incredible. Instead of having solar panels so cheap, we could just cover any surface we want with them. Janet Yellen's like, please stop producing solar panels. Make them more expensive. Did you see the clip of Mr. Uh, Borelli complaining about being cucked by Nim? I did see this. This is bait. But at the same time, you know what? 
Bet. Who cares? Who cares that this is this is bait from fool. him, right? Who gives a shit? He wanted us all to see it, so let's take a look. Let's watch the bait. See if this is good bait. It was such a horrible trip. Oh my god. Normally, whenever me and Melina would travel, um, we would usually only do cuck stuff for a single night. But because Nim, I guess she really wanted like somebody who was like Middle Eastern and had like a 15 inch dick or whatever, because it's like four times bigger than mine. I had to do it for four nights. I, they, so they would lock me in the corner of the room and just I would be getting cucked over and over and over again. It's a brutal trip. It was such a horrible trip. Oh, my God. No I think he's 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 creating this clip in response to this. English. No, I'm just doing this Can I put this mask Give him a little kiss on the cheek. I, th I think I, I was about to just put some after. Okay. I'm not okay with it. Ew, you licked it. Who licked somebody's face? She just licked his face. That's okay. You're getting it's cut. Him. I mean, let's be real. No English, no. This is literally my inspiration. I mean, hell yeah, brother. All right, let's go back to making fun of Hutch. Anyway. I want to show you something, yeah, chat. A chatter audience. sent Remember? me a clip of apparently Hutch doesn't know history at all. What, what's wrong with this? This is incredibly based. What's wrong with this? Sword panels are so cheap. Some European homes are using them as guard fences. Good. So what? What is wrong with this? And... Who cares? The solar panels are cheaper than wood. <laughs> Let's go. Good. All right, we're going to put up East Coast Earthquake in there. So everybody knows that I felt it. East Coast Earthquake. It's in my title now. Okay? We're good. Wow. It's like they were trying to target me. They missed. Remember, remember all those motherfuckers that literally precisely did that, by the way? They were like, Hassan. I think it was Hutch. It must have been. Was it Hutch? It was a bunch of orbiters that literally... Fuck, come on, where are my, where are my fucking clippers now? I, I, where, where are they at? Where are they at? It was Hutch, right? And all the orbiters that fucking stuck to it. I, I'm pretty sure he fucking uh, tweeted about it too. When I was in Pennsylvania, I was more to the east than fucking like Philadelphia. Bro, you are, you don't know what you're talking about. That's okay though. I was bored to the east in like Atlanta. <laughs> like, there's got to be one person in here that remembers that exact tweet and can pull it up so we can look at it. Yeah, I'm really important. Was another one. Was another orbiter who was like losing his mind over it, uh, being like, "Dude, he doesn't care. He clearly doesn't care about the hostages. What the fuck?" Of those posters in and of itself is not to be like, "Look at all these uh, children that are." Okay, we saw this like what five I times. I didn't just fucking say those posters are being propped up specifically for that reason. I also followed that up in the longer video that you just saw about how. Israel has no real interest in protecting the hostages because they're blowing them up. Okay. The other thing that, uh, that Hassan was doing is Hassan was telling people not to tear down the posters. Like, do you, you know what I mean? Like, Hassan was telling people not to tear down the posters because it, it makes their side look bad. And people clip that as him being an anti-Semite somehow. Huh? Huh? Hey. 
I the only that. people not to tear down the posters is anti semitism On November 5th, 2023. Okay? And it was valid, and it was a correct take. But of course, they clipped it to be like, Hassan is peddling anti-Semitic conspiracies. It was 100% correct. Everything I said there was 100% correct. And once again, history did vindicate me. These girls wear short skirts to trick men into raping them. I like how the only way Hassan can convince his audience not to be anti-Semitic is by peddling an anti-Semitic is, uh, is somebody who moved from the apartheid state of, of South Africa. The apartheid ended and they moved to Israel. They're just doing the racism world tour. <laughs> They're like, I want to convert to Judaism so I could be racist again. If it gets the job done. Hassan is turning into the new Alex the Jones. Apartheid Where are they at score, now? Uh, keeper. Where are these motherfuckers at now? They've got like, this like they're going to the find any place that it's super racist and get like a little uh, recent visit uh, stamp. Collect them all. First, I was born in Rhodesia. <laughs> Top 10 most redacted things Hassan has ever said, right? Where are they at now? Did you see the moment when Twitter was telling Hassan that Iran was attacking Tel Aviv? Uh, who cares? Who cares? Misinformation on Twitter. Congrat. Welcome to welcome to uh, Elon Musk's shithole website. The purpose of Elon Musk buying Twitter was to make it a shithole because it was being used to pressure to the elites, the elites from the populist left. That's the reason why they bought it. They wanted to make it a shithole, and the re and what did they do? How did they counter the populist left by unbanning all the Nazis? It's, it's very straightforward. You can see how libs use Nazis to target uh, a growing, a nascent left. Did you see the new feed feature on mobile? It's basically TikTok, but live streams of people you follow instead. Is that a, is that a Twitch thing? I haven't, I don't usually use the mobile app. I watch Twitch on my desktop. Usually I'm like gaming or, or working, you know, on the other screen or just chilling. You know what I mean? I don't like to use my phone to watch Twitch. I'm not really a big phone enjoyer anyway. I only really look at like, tech, like, like Twitter to, to maul as I'm taking shits or waiting for something. You know what I mean? I really need to get like a Steam Deck so I could just stop using my phone completely. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah, brother. I fear the next four years is going to be Biden's admin not even confirming a single judge because of an obstruction to Senate as Biden exclusively talks about how many concessions he's willing to make to Republicans in order to fix our deficit. Hassan, give us like five minutes for fuck's sake. Where are they at now? Well, you see, he had to do that because it's the only way to, you know, he has to bend over backwards to kiss the Republicans' ass. They have to do that because if they, if they went too far left, then that would mean that the Republicans would lose too much. And that would be bad by, for bipartisanship. Biden doesn't want to do too many good things because that would be bad for bipartisanship because the Republicans would get walloped. So he's worried that the Republicans would lose too, by too much. So he doesn't want to do too many good things. You understand? He wants the Republican Party to be strong. And now you may think, you, you, you know, you might think, you might think, Mike, that's, that's ridiculous. That's, that's, all, that's, that's insane. What are you talking about? You're, you're joking, right? You're, you're, you're joking, right? No, I'm not. Biden literally said, if the Democrats won by too much, it would be bad for bipartisanship. Huh? That, that can't be real, right? That can't be real. Biden, no party should have too much power. Former Vice President Joe Biden said he's concerned about what would happen if Republicans get clobbered in next year's election. 
Suggesting such an outcome would be harmful to bipartisanship. I'm really worried that no party should have too much power, Biden told reporters Friday during his bus tour in Iowa. You need a countervailing force. The comments reported by BuzzFeed News come as Biden remains one of the sole 2020 candidates to repeatedly tout efforts to work with Republicans. How did that work out for him? There's an awful lot of really good Republicans out there, he said in August at a Massachusetts fundraiser. I get in trouble for saying that with Democrats, but the truth of the matter is, every time we ever got in trouble with our administration, remember who got sent up to, sent up to Capitol Hill to fix it? Me. Because they know I respect the other team. Why do you want the people who respect the other team to go up? Don't you want the other don't you want somebody who's gonna beat the other team? Like if we're doing the sports analogy, don't you want somebody who's gonna beat the other team? Incredible. Where are you at? When you were getting boinks on Call of Duty Modern Warfare with Dr. Disrespect, I was doing political comment. Hutch said to your chatter that he wouldn't vote for Biden if he had rushed Trump's prosecution at the suggestion Biden could have gotten Merrick Garland to act quicker. He believes in democracy, he said. Huh? It's not a rush of the prosecution. There's no such thing as rushing a prosecution. There's no such thing as rushing a prosecution. You don't have the right to sit around for years so that you can... Uh, then claim the uh, uh, prosecution is political. If they had done the prosecution quickly and put Trump in prison, if they had impeached Trump on January 6th instead of January 15th and given him five days to or seven days to fucking uh, uh, rally his base around himself, then they might have actually got him removed from office. If they had moved quickly, they would have probably been able to defeat Trump once and for all, but they were cowardly and slow, just like Hutch. Terry, you dumb fuck. That's why I know what the fuck I'm talking about, and you do not. Whoo! Maybe I should do this more often. To just like show all the dumb fuckers who constantly fucking, who constantly chirp about like, Hassan gets things wrong. Hassan gets things wrong all the time. He's peddling misinformation all the time. That like, no, it is you who's peddling misinformation. All right. I have like, a really funny clip that somebody uploaded to YouTube. They said it's from yesterday. And I just, I just want to show you something really funny, chat. This is, this is what happens when you watch Destiny a lot. You kind of don't know anything, but somewhere you get convinced, and this is the worst belief you could have, which is, if I believe it, it must be right. This is the, this is the ultimate sign you're a moron. Is you just invent things, you didn't actually do the reading, and you know you didn't do the reading, right? You know you don't know what you're talking about. But you think just by, you know, picking up your, um, I don't know, TikTok or Twitter posts, you know what you're talking about. And this is the world that Hutch and Destiny live in. They don't actually do any of the homework. And, and let me tell you something, chat. When you're in high school, I'm going to be brutally honest, I didn't have to do the homework to get A's. I didn't have to do the homework to get A's. In most of my undergrad classes, same. I was just better at recalling information I learned in lectures. So I didn't have to study that much. But eventually you get to a high level, higher level of, of, of scholarship and eventually you get humbled. Eventually you start having to study. You have to start doing the reading. And you go, oh, there are other smart people in the world. Now, if you drop out of college and you never challenge yourself intellectually, you never get, I guess, the humility to understand that there are some things that you need to study. And you need to understand that there are other people that are smart and they know shit. If you became, say, a perpetually adolescent video gamer, and you hung out with the dumbest underachievers on the planet, then you might uh, fancy yourself the smartest person in the room. 
and this is not the case. And so I want to show you five minutes of utter humiliation. This is basic knowledge. My God. That's what you're doing, buddy. buddy. You need to spend some time off the internet not discussing these things, and you need to crack open a fucking book. Now, I love how crack open a fucking book is being used rhetorically by someone who has never read a book. Is what you need to do. You're you are, reacting you, to shape. You color. are wildly out of your depth in these conversations. <laughs> do you understand? I did not work out. Do you understand that part of the reason why Hitler was able to consolidate power in the way that he was, was because, because, the, so like because the social Democrats in Germany, the leftist, the, the leftist, you know about the, that the leftist, read, the, left, about that. That the, the leftist, the leftist block in Germany refused to make a distinction between the moderate liberal party and, and Hitler. Uh, so that's, that's not the case. That is absolutely not the case. So here's the thing. Hutch is actually fumbling a criticism that the center left is try tries to make about this pe period, which is that the Communist Party, the KPD, Communist Party of Deutschland, called the Social Democrats social fascists. And the reason why they did that is because during the immediate post-World War I period, there was an attempted revolution and the Social Democrats sided with the nascent fascists to kill the leaders of the socialist movement that were trying to give a socialist revolution to Germany. They sided with the Freikorps, is what it's called, okay? And so there was a lot of bla bad blood between communists and the uh, Social Democrats and socialists within Germany because of that context. And then there was, you know, so that was what we're talking about here, is the Social Democrats siding with the fascists to crush the left. Now, later on, there were very left-wing elements of the Social Democrats, which were quite good. And that the line of, you know, uh, Social Democrats are basically fascists, oh, that was a mistake. And eventually, the communists and the Social Democrats did recognize that and they formed a united front against the fascists so the socialists the social democrats and the communists united against the fascist okay well if that's the case how did hitler come to power how did hitler come to power hitler came to power because of liberals and conservatives giving them voting to give hitler absolute power Hitler, Hitler never broke 40%. Hitler was in the, Hitler's party never got more than 30% of the vote in Germany, yet he became absolute leader. How did that happen? Apparently, Hutch has no fucking idea. Now, who is to blame for the left not being coherent? Is it the, is it the fault of the Social Democrats for smashing a, a revolution 10 years ago, 10 years prior? or five years prior, which caused a lot of bad blood, obviously, if the, your leaders are murdered by fascists, uh, you probably are not going to want to work with that party for a while, right? Is it their fault? I would say yes. Or is it the fault of the communists for not having the prescience to understand that Hitler was actually unique, uniquely evil? Nobody had seen somebody like Hitler yet, so you could almost understand why they made that mistake. How, that being said... I think it's fair to say both communists and social democrats made significant errors in combating Hitler. Duh. The liberal wing had to give Hitler uh, the power, right? They had no, to do it. I'm tr I'm tr made him do it, right? No. Who I'm tr had to give Hitler no, the power? No. Was it, was the, it was the voters. It was the voters. But in part. No, it wasn't. The, no, it, no, 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 you understand it was that you, you understand that he won. You don't a, understand basic history, dude. That is crazy. It wasn't the voters. He didn't win a majority. He had to have the liberal government because they thought they could control it. They didn't want to give it to the socialists because uh, how do you think how do you think elections work? What do you mean with the parliamentary system? 
Yeah. They're like, Hutch, you're embarrassing yourself. No, no, we're going to make sure everybody knows how... And by the way, look at the arrogance that Hutch has here. He doesn't know what he's talking about, and he knows he doesn't know what he's talking about, but he's watched so much Destiny, he thought that he could just kind of bullshit and kind of half remember things and go ahead and act arrogantly. Wait, we're, I can't wait till he opens the Wikipedia page. He needed the liberals to give him the... What was it? The, the chancellorship? He wouldn't have gotten it without the liberals. It wasn't the socialists. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, and it wasn't the, the social democrats either. This, okay, this is on, basic gonna, shit. Look this up okay, right. Wikipedia. Let's bring up Wikipedia. Let's go. Let's, let's, yeah. No. The SPD were the Social Democratic Party. They could have formed a, a coalition with the Liberal Party in Germany at the time, but they failed to make a distinction between the Nazis and the Liberals, and that is what in, in initially led to the rise of the Nazi Party. Actually, this is not the case. The SPD, in fact, formed coalitions with Liberals, bourgeois parties, bourgeois liberal parties, and part of the reason why Hitler grew in popularity was they had a austerity response to the Great Depression. They went, they tacked to the right and did austerity cuts in response to the Great Depression, making the Great Depression worse in Germany. In fact, it was the liberal uh, side of the SPD that made the conditions pl plausible for the rise of Hitler. This is all basic fucking history. In fact, there's a fun game that I just saw the other day. Hold on. Anger Mentum was uh, posting it. How do you spell his stupid fucking bullshit name? Fuck. Is it Enter Mentum? How do you spell it? It's like, Ent oh, there it is. Okay. Entinger Mentum. Fuck me. He posted a game where you basically are the SPD. Oh, here it is. And you try to prevent Hitler from taking power. It's called Social Democracy and Alternate History. Maybe Hutch should play some video game, play that video game. And so he can learn a little bit. I am trying to draw a parallel between what happened between what screen? happened between what happened back then and what Here, I hear and what I hear Hutch, can you pull up the Wikipedia link I just sent you in the chat? It's Hitler's rights to power. Let's do a Wikipedia screen. Mm -hmm. And then go to test their Now this is where Wik this is why Wikipedia is very useful for people like Hutch, because it offers a survey level uh, uh, account of an event all right this is this is kind of like you know sixth grade reading level kind of basic information um you know that you could plausibly say is supported by some evidence so that's what wikipedia is for wikipedia is like a jumping off point but you should never read wikipedia as a complete and utter uh full scholarly uh approach of these information uh, of of like analysis or something right however However, however, they can tell you what basic facts happened and when. It's usually pretty decent about that. Well, are you skipping the election? <laughs> no, I understand. You're right. I just want to read this line to you. Are you the skipping March the election? It literally says right here, at the March 1933 elections, again, you're projecting, you're assuming I'm going to say things that I'm not actually saying, so just stay with me. Don't, don't put words in my mouth. Mm -hmm. At the March 1933 elections, again, no single party secured a majority. Mm -hmm. Hitler required the vote of the center party and conservatives in the Reichstag to obtain the powers he desired. It was the center party, not the socialists, that, that handed this power to him. Do you understand that? Hold on. I mean, that's just a... I mean, this is basic facts. It was the... Bourgeois Center Party, which was this kind of like Christian Democrat party that represented the, uh, uh, it was like a Catholic uh, clerical as well. And they were moderates. And they're the ones who gave Hitler power. And their party had a huge 
civil war kind of uh, about it. They kind of had like a little, a, a huge uh, internal schism. And a large part of the center party said, don't, let's not give, vote to give Hitler pow absolute power. Let's not do that. But the people who were, wor uh, 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 but the leaders of the party decided that they would after they got assurances that the center party would be allowed to continue to exist after the banning of the Social Democratic Party and the Communist Party. And guess what happened? Hitler banned every party but Nazis. Whoops. Hitler never gave the... Hitler gave them assurances and then broke the assurances. Oops. So Hutch just reading Wikipedia for the first time. And at, he started this clip. Hutch started this clip telling people to read books. Here's him reading about the Hitler's rise to power for the first fucking time. Brain dead. Oh, it's going to be a while, chat. This is, by the way, this silence, this is not paused. He's just reading for the first time. A liberal is reading for the first time. Deafening dead air. Rare footage of a liberal learning. Micro brain. Hutch, end the call. Hutch, end the call. Hutch, end the call. Hutch, Hutch, you're learning. Oh shit. Oh fuck, Hutch. Hutch, end the call. Oh fuck. You've been exposed. Oh, Hutch. He's deafening silence. Deafening silence. Uh, he's, he's going, oh, fuck. How do I spin this so I don't look like an idiot? How do I spin? This is destiny in every debate he's ever had with anybody who knows what they're talking about. How do I spin? How do I pivot? Bear with me. There it is. <laughs> The groundwork for the Nazi dictatorship was laid when the Reichstag was set on fire in February, asserting that the communists were behind the arson. Hitler convinced von Hindenburg to pass the Reichstag fire decree, which severely curtailed the liberties and rights of German citizens. Using the decree, Hitler became eliminated his political opponents. Following its passage, Hitler began arguing for more drastic means to curtail political opposition and proposed the Enabling Act of 1933. Once enacted, this law gave the German government the power to override individual rights prescribed by the Constitution and vested the Chancellor, Hitler, with emergency powers to pass and enforce laws without parliamentary oversight. So let's look at this. I want you to show. Okay, so what's the, how did the Enabling Act work? Let's, how did the Enabling Act work? The Wall Street crash of 1929 heralded worldwide economic disaster. The Nazis and communists made great gains at the 1930 federal election. The Nazis and communists between them secured 40% of Reichstag seats, which required the moderate parties to consider negotiations with anti-democrats. The communists, wrote historian Alan Bullock, openly announced they would prefer to see the Nazis in power rather than lift a figure to save the republic. Now, this is, by the way, something they changed their mind on. Uh, and we're going to get, we'll get into that later, uh, which was a mistake, obviously very stupid. Um, a middle-class liberal party strong enough to block the Nazis did not exist. The People's Party and the Democrats suffered severe losses to Nazis at the poll. The Social Democrats were essentially a conservative trade union party with ineffectual leadership. Okay, this is way too much. What did this? This has got like way too much. I mean, this is true, but it's like, hmm, this is not very uh, uh, encyclopedic. 
The Catholic Center Party maintained its voting block, but was preoccupied with defending its own particular interests and wrote Bullock. So they just got this one guy. They're just quoting this one historian. Through 1932-3, was so far from recognizing the danger of a Nazi dictatorship that it continued to negotiate with the Nazis. Hold on, let me see. Hold on, I'm finding, I'm finding exactly the thing that I'm going to show you. I, I'm, I'm finding the enabling act because this is the important part. <clears throat> so the enabling act is the is the law that gave, uh, that gave Hitler absolute power. All right, and so it was brought into Parliament for a vote. Oh, fuck. We're, we've got a nail for fuck's sake. There we go. We found it. Okay. So they, they banned the Communist Party, right? They just outright banned the Communist Party. Despite, so all the people that were elected as communists were not allowed to go to the... They were arrested by Hitler. Who had been appointed by Hindenburg. Who the... Uh, 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 the, the centrists had elected a, instead of because they said Hindenburg was going to, well, hey, Hindenburg may be conservative and old, but he'll stop Hitler. Well, then Hindenburg appointed Hitler as chancellor. Hitler allied with other nationalist and conservative factions and they steamrolled over the Social Democrats at the 5 March 1933 German federal election. Germans voted in an atmosphere of extreme voter intimidation perpetuated by the Nazi Sturm Albeitung militia. Contrary to popular belief, Hitler did not win an outright majority of the Reichstag as the majority of Germans did not vote for the Nazi party. The election was actually a setback for the Nazis. So in other words, Hutch said the voters voted for Hitler. Nope. In order to guarantee its passage, the Nazis implemented a strategy of coercion, bribery, and manipulation. Hitler removed any remaining political obstacles so his coalition of conservatives, nationalists, and Nazis could, could begin building the Nazi dictatorship. By mid-March, the government began sending communists, labor union leaders, and other political dissidents to Dachau. That's, have you ever heard the poem, first they came for the communists, then they came for the socialists, then they came for the trade unionists? You guys remember that? Remember that poem? Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Remember that? That's what happened. The Enabling Act allowed the National Ministry to enact legislation, including laws, deviating or altering the Constitution without the consent of the Reichstag, which, is the, which was the parliament. Because the law allowed for departures from the constitutions, it was itself considered a constitutional amendment. Thus, its passage required the support of two-thirds of those deputies who were present and voting. A quorum of two-thirds of the entire Reichstag was required to be present in order to call up the bill. The Social Democrats and the Communists were expected to vote against the act. The government had already arrested all Communist and some Social Democrat deputies under the Reichstag fire decree. 
The Nazis expected the parties representing the middle class, the junkers, and business interests to vote for the measure, as they had grown weary of the instability of the Weimar Republic and would not dare to resist. In other words, the liberals, the bourgeois parties, were weak, and they sided with Hitler. Hitler believed that with the center party members' votes, he would get the necessary two-thirds majority. Hitler negotiated with the Center Party's chairman. This is the Liberal Party chat. It's literally called the Center Party. Ludwig Kass, a Catholic priest, finalizing the agreement by 22 March. Kass agreed to support the act in exchange for assurances of the civil Center Party's continued existence, the protection of Catholic civil and religious liberties, religious schools, and the retention of civil servants affiliated with the Center Party. It has also been suggested that some members of the SPD were intimidated by the presence of Nazi Strom Albaitong throughout the proceedings. Some historians, such as Klaus Schlauder, have maintained that Hitler also promised to negotiate a Reichskonkordat with the Holy See, a treaty that formalized the position of the Catholic Church in Germany on a national level. Debate within the center party continued until the day of the vote. 23 March 1933, with Cass advocating voting in favor of the act, referring to an upcoming written guarantee from Hitler, while former Chancellor Heinrich Brüning called for a rejection of the act. The majority sided with Cass, and Brodig agreed to maintain party discipline by voting for the act. Under the Weimar Constitution, a quorum of two-thirds of the entire Reichstag membership was required to be present in order to bring up a constitutional amendment bill. In this case, 432 of the Reichstag's 647 deputies would have normally been required for a quorum. However, Goring reduced the quorum to 378 by not counting the 81 communist deputies. Despite the virulent rhetoric directed against the communists, the Nazis did not formally ban the KPD right away. Not only did they fear a violent uprising, but they hoped the KPD's presence on the ballot would siphon votes off from the SPD. However, it was an open secret that the KPD deputies would never be allowed to take their seats, and they were thrown in jail as quickly as the police could track them down. Courts began taking the line that since the communists were responsible for the fire, Communist Party membership was an act of treason. Thus, for all intents and purposes, the KPD was banned as of 6 March, the day after the election. Goring also declared that any deputy who was absent without excuse was to be considered as present in order to overcome obstructions, leaving nothing to chance. The Nazis used the provision of the Reichstag fire decree to detain several Social Democratic Party deputies. Hitler's speech with Reichstag assembled under intimidating circumstances with SA men swarming inside and outside the chamber. Hitler's speech, which emphasized the importance of Christianity and German culture, was aimed at particularly at appeasing the center party's sensibilities and incorporated Cass's requested guarantees almost verbatim. Cass gave a speech voicing his party's support for the bill amid concerns put aside, while Brüning notably remained silent. Only SPD Chairman Otto Wells spoke against the act, declaring that the proposed bill would destroy ideals which are eternal and indestructible. Excuse me. Declared that the proposed bill could not destroy ideals which are eternal and indestructible. Cass had still not received the written constitutional guarantees he had negotiated. But with the assurance it was being typed up, voting began. Cass never received the letter. So in other words, the liberals were so fucking stupid and so played by the far right they voted to give Hitler absolute power without even getting any guarantee. Obviously, if Hitler wrote something in paper, it would have been toilet paper. In 
In the end, all parties except the SPD voted in favor of the enabling act. With the KPD banned and 26 SPD deputies arrested or in hiding, the final tally was 444 in favor of the enabling act against 94, all social democrats opposed. The Reichstag had adopted the enabling act with the support of 83% of the deputies. So this happened because they banned almost 100 communist deputies and they arrested another 26 social democrat deputies this was a this was the center party the center party and there's a bunch of smaller parties but this center party was the liberal party here's their image So Hutch has the idea that it was the communists and the socialists that were responsible for Hitler's absolute power. Where did he get this idea? Where are they at? Where are they at? It was Hutch, right? And all the orbiters that fucking stuck to it. I I'm pretty sure he fucking uh, tweeted about it too. There's got to be one person in here that remembers that exact tweet and can pull it up so we can look at it. Yeah, I'm really important was another one. It was another orbiter who was like losing his mind over it. Uh, being like, dude, he doesn't care. He clearly doesn't care about the hostages. What the fuck? Of those posters in and of itself is not to be like, look at all these uh, children that are lost. The point of these posters, the real point of these posters is so that someone goes and fucking tries to rip it off so they can fucking film it and go, look, look at these scary Arabs. They hate it. They have no interest in, in, in Israeli lives. Point of those posters in and of itself. Yeah, what happened? What happened? Wait. Posters Hassan says the real point of these Israeli hostage posters is to trick people into tearing them down so they can be filmed to make Arabs look bad. This dude is really peddling Jewish conspiracy theories like weirdos on the right. Next, he'll be saying Soros paid for them. Huh. There was a lot of other parts from that. Here, this is, a, this is literally a perfect... By the way, this is a perfect uh, example of how, like, things get clipped out of context and people fucking yell at me on Twitter over it. Okay. Think, what did I say? I didn't just fucking say those posts are being propped up specifically for that reason. I also followed that up in the longer video that you just saw about how Israel has no real interest in protecting the hostages because they're blowing them up. Okay. I said that. On November 5th, 2023. Okay? And it was valid, and it was a correct take. But of course, they clipped it to be like, Hassan is peddling anti-Semitic conspiracies. It was 100% correct. Everything I said there was 100% correct. And once again, history did vindicate me. These girls wear short skirts to trick men into raping them. I like how the only way Hassan can convince his audience not to be anti-Semitic is by peddling an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Hey, man, if it gets the job done. Hassan is turning into the new Alex Jones. Where are they at now? Where are these motherfuckers at now? This has got to be in the top 10 most redacted things Hassan has ever said, right? Where are they at now? I fear the next four years is going to be Biden's admin not even confirming a single judge because of an obstructionist Senate as Biden exclusively talks about how many concessions he's willing to make to Republicans in order to fix our deficit. Hassan, give us like five minutes for fuck's sake. Where are they at now? Where are you at? When you were getting doinks on Call of Duty Modern Warfare with Dr. Disrespect, I was doing political commentary, you dumb fuck. 
That's why I know what the fuck I'm talking about, and you do not. True. Whoo! Maybe I should do this more often to just like show all the dumb fuckers who constantly fucking who constantly chirp about like Hassan gets things wrong. Hassan gets things wrong all the time. He's peddling misinformation all the time that like, no, it is you who is peddling misinformation. Like at the top of the hour, there isn't three minute ad breaks. There are. It's misinformation to think that there isn't. Mike from PA does this often and boy, it's fun for the community. Where are they at? True. Whenever you're proven right, they just ignore it and move on to the next thing. It's annoying. Well, there's a thousand of them. See, this is why you have to take the time to show what you were right. Because, you know, before I used to be like, I used to have faith in the like attention span of other people. And then I realized, what am I doing? And... That's why you'll see people talk about uh, Hassan was wrong about uh, uh, Russia invading Ukraine because they have a talking points. And the point is they want to create a, 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 a bunch of talking points. So you need to have counterpoints. Like that's what you need. In that same video, in this same video, at a certain point, I also mentioned that the hostage posters are being ripped in Israel by ultra Zionists because it makes Netanyahu look bad because the people that post the hostage posters in Israel are actually posting it specifically because they want the government to stop bombing the hostages. <sighs> anyway. What is this? I think there's a concern that you will help justify Israel's actions in Gaza if you acknowledge that sexual violence occurred on 10-7, but there's no reason why you can't both acknowledge those atrocities and condemn Israel's violence. They're not mutually exclusive the actual report findings show something very different to the way this new un report was presented in the media it was also correct just like the top of the hour ad break is coming for you and and by the way chat no one ever 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 said that there was absolutely no sexual violence committed by hamas or by by people who were doing attacks on october 7th what we said was not true was the policy of rape being used as a weapon as a matter of policy or that it was widespread. That's literally not. And that was not the case. And the New York Times tried to find evidence of it and it couldn't. So that, and yet these people were using that idea as propaganda to justify the carpet bombing that was happening in Gaza. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. They, uh, the AI, the AI uh, targeting system highlighted all the building as red first before we just dropped the unguided dumb bombs on apartment buildings. And that is correct. So I can Here's be precise about what's happening. You can literally be right every time and it doesn't matter, brother. They never get off the hate train. They just go dark and cook waiting and, uh, for the next opportunity to jump on you. Correct. When I clarify my position and over explain things, you have to understand I'm not doing it for you. You've heard it a million times over. Okay. I'm doing it for the fans that are coming in from those communities that are primed into thinking that are primed into thinking that I'm in the wrong, that are primed to fucking hate. 
Bro, I saw a hater saying you were pro-Israel a few days ago. That's awesome. Yeah. People that say I'm pro-Israel are, are like people who say I'm transphobic. You know what I mean? It's just like, I don't think you can get people to, to genuinely believe that position. Yeah. Mr. Bonarelli got cooked so hard, I think he's done covering Israel. Eh. He can't let it go. We'll see. It would be smart for him to shut the fuck up about Israel and then quietly act like he never advocated for the things that he advocated for. Yeah. I mean, it, it's too late. It's too late now. He got exposed. He, uh, like, the Brianna Woos and, and the... Uh, I'm at, in the Destinies, I'm so glad this happened. I'm so glad this happened because there was nothing worse than people going... Destiny's a progressive, and and you're just too extreme. And he's he's he could talk to normal people, and it's like motherfucker, are you insane? But now he's been exposed as literally saying he's Islamophobic, advocating for the use of nuclear weapons, advocating for the ethnic cleansing of Gazans. Like he's been exposed as an extreme freak on yet another topic. I mean. If you didn't know that he was an extreme freak when he advocated that Black Lives Matter protesters be mowed down by white redneck militias, or you didn't know he was a freak when he advocated for, you know, uh, the moral acceptability of incest, or you didn't think he was a freak when he argued that white people should be able to use the N-word, uh, uh, like, you, if you didn't think he was a freak for the myriad shit that he said over the years. Now, this is not about him as a person. This is not about him being you know, one of the most infamous cucks on the entire planet. This is not about him being two-time divorced. This is not about him being uh, weird. This is about his policies, okay? This is not about the fact that, you know, he went around saying that he knew how to, that you monogamists were freaks. By the way, the idea that you have this guy who's the most libertine, uh... Uh, guy with an open marriage is going to appeal to normies is truly incredible internet brain now I support polyamory as a acceptable life choice for people to make because I'm a radical leftist but I also recognize that that is a tough thing to explain to normies normies are not really uh, on board the polyamory train. But the entire reason why people said that Destiny was left-wing was because he was a libertarian on his sexual mores, mores, which is uh, he wants to fuck everything. So that makes him left-wing, I guess. He's trying to backpedal now. <laughs> Destiny refuses to buy IDF's excuse for deadly strike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the guy who said that it wouldn't be genocide if they nuked Gaza. I guess they killed white people. I guess they killed white people. So that's, that's the Destiny turning point. You could kill 40,000 brown kids. That's okay. Wah, wah, wah. I thought every target was, I thought every target was precise, Destiny. Wah, wah, wah. All right. Uh, I think that's good for now, unless you guys have more clips. I'm done making fun of the libs. Unless you have like more clips that are like more funny. Biden has officially, oh, and listen to this chat. It is what it is, and this horrible thing happened. And what I said very plainly is. Tesla scraps low-cost car plans amid fierce Chinese EV competition. What a fucking moron. Tesla has canceled the long-promised inexpensive cars that investors have been counting on to drive its growth into a mass-market automaker. 
the automaker will continue developing self-driving robo taxis. <laughs> His first master plan for the company in 2006 called for manufacturing luxury models first, then using the profits to finance a low-cost family car. And you know what China did? They just made that. He has since repeatedly promised such a vehicle to investors and consumers. As recently as January, Musk told investors that Tesla planned to start production of the affordable model at its Tesla factory in the second half of 2025. Tesla's cheapest current model, the Model 3 sedan, retails for 39000 in the United States. Now defunct entry-level vehicle, sometimes described as the Model 2, was expected to start at about 25000 The stark reversal comes as Tesla faces fierce competition globally from Chinese electric vehicle mo makers fl flooding the market with cars priced as low as $10,000. Now, chat, what's wrong with this? Assuming for a second, like, like... That just means everybody gets an inexpensive car. What the fuck's wrong with this? As opposed to having massive debt. Mobility is a human right. Elon's directive is to go all in on RoboTaxi. Oh my god, Tesla's stock has got to be crashing. That shit is a vaporware. See chat? Mike was right. Mike was right. I told you back in 2021, this was massively overpriced piece of shit company. Holy shit. But it was up at 420. I was like, this is well, this is fucking crazy. A fourth person with knowledge of Tesla's plans expressed optimism about the decision to pivot away from the cheap car strategy in favor of robo taxis. Squeezing profits from entry level vehicles is a challenge for any automaker, but Tesla's delay in pursuing the car. Musk once called his dream, made it much tougher because now he faces far more competition in that price range. Maybe he should have just done it then. Tesla spent years developing its highly experimental Cybertruck, a pricey electric pickup. <laughs> what a fucking idiot! America gets owned again because we put we put authority and power in the hands of right-wing billionaires instead of logic reason <sighs> incredible i'm gerhard elfes welcome to all right chat we've got ourselves a new second thought video the real reason the u.s wants to ban tiktok here's the answer chat because it provides an alternative source of news and, and commentary that isn't gatekept by the rich. They don't like the democratization of media. They don't like the democratization of media. They don't want you to be able to pick your media. They want you to have to be forced to watch MSNBC. Missed the last few days. Do you want an update on the elections? Go for it, bro. Did you see the crowd at San Francisco attacking the robo taxi? Oh no. I would not recommend you do that next to a car with like 80 sensors and 80 cameras. I think the robo taxis were like blocking traffic. Like they got confused and they just like stopped.
fuck? Before we start the video, I need to make a humble request. I don't have any sponsors left because I'm not willing to compromise my principles on the Palestine issue. AdSense revenue has also fallen off a cliff. This operation is officially losing money, and that's not sustainable. If okay. This is just the way it goes, you know? That's just the way it goes. If you stand up for your principles, you're not going to be getting sponsorships. That's the way it goes. If you appreciate the work we're doing here and you're in a position to help, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Has AdSense fallen off? I don't really pay attention to Google ads. I mean, I haven't really... I mean, admittedly, I'd have to look at my... I'd have to look at my Twitch ads. I mean, my Twitch ads are... They're not, they're not, I mean, they're going up. It's going up again. It was, it was really low in February and January, as it is. Every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to greatly appreciate your support. Hope you enjoy the support episode. Support people you like, or they won't exist. Yeah. This is bright. Today we're talking about TikTok. The app that started out as people doing funny dances and evolved into one of the most important news sources in history. People doing funny dances. Uh-huh. Yeah, people. Not 17-year-old teenage girls being watched by guys that are uh, weird. This is why I never joined TikTok. It was just kind of like a creepy... It was a creepy app for the most of its beginning. You know what I mean? Like, was it the first, like, the biggest content creator, just a 17-year-old doing dances? Skitty white girls doing dancing? Like, what was it? You're too old for TikTok? So true. I don't have TikTok. <laughs> it's a, it was a very creepy when it started. Where you can get lost down a rabbit hole of boar running around set to night. My channel have a TikTok? I think my mods made a TikTok at some point, but I've never downloaded it. Well, but I almost want to just because now of the of the ban. Now that it's matured as a platform and it's no longer just, you know, creepy at first like Facebook was. I mean, all apps start very creepy. Have you heard about Reddit? Core, then get a 60 second masterclass in how the CIA works from a guy who doesn't say a single word. Why does the U.S. government want to ban TikTok so badly? Let's find out. It's Israel. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic-tac-toe. A winner. A winner. You just know she practiced that in the mirror and was like, yeah, that's fire. Okay, cringe politicians aside, where to begin with this whole TikTok saga? I guess let's start with a quick rundown on recent events. And I want to give a disclaimer here right up front. Production for this episode started on March 15th, so I might have to add in an update at some point in the video. I'll let you know if that ends up happening. Anyway, over the last week, Congress advanced federal legislation to force ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, to sell its shares in the US version of the app. And if they don't comply, the app will be Did banned. that get through the Senate? I don't think it got through the Senate, did it? I think it was blocked in the Senate, right? I don't remember it passing through the Senate unless I missed that story, which, you know, I'm not infallible, so it's possible. Because Biden said he would sign it. But from our, as far as I could see, it, it didn't make any progress in the Senate because Trump spoke up against it. Why? China. 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 What nation are you a citizen? Singapore. Are Singapore. you a citizen of any other nation? No, Senator. Have you ever applied for Chinese citizenship? Senator, I served my nation I'm in asked, Singapore. I, no, I, I did not. Do you have a Singaporean passport? Yes, and I served my military for two, two and a half years in Singapore. Do you have any other, do you have any other passports from any other nations? No, Senator. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean, no. American politicians and the FBI have long claimed that TikTok constitutes a national security risk, that it's a Trojan horse for the Communist Party of China, basically saying that the CPC is using the app to spy on Americans. We'll get to the hypocrisy of that statement in a bit, but first, let's take a, a brief look at the history of this attempt to get rid of TikTok.
Back in 2020, Trump made the first attempt to bonk the app by signing an executive order stating that TikTok would be banned in the US if it wasn't sold within 45 days. One White House official said at the time, quote, this 45 day delay will give Microsoft and other interested purchasers the time to deal with TikTok's owners that adequately addresses the national security concerns posed by the app. No such deals were struck, and after some negotiations, ByteDance agreed to partner with US software giant Oracle to protect US data. Which is more than a little ironic, because two years later- Oracle Oracle's is literally a CIA front. So, your data is hoovered up on TikTok by the CIA, congrats. Oracle got slapped with a lawsuit for collecting and selling personal data on millions of people. That data included full names, addresses, location details, political views, and online activity. Seems like a bad company to partner with if we care about data privacy, right? In 2022, we saw the official launch of the $1.5 billion Project Texas, referring to Oracle's Texas headquarters. TikTok began routing all its US user data through Oracle's cloud service. At which point, Oracle supposedly vetted the app's algorithms and moderation tools to make sure there was no outside influence from the Chinese government. TikTok was fully compliant, having worked for over a year to partition its US version backend and code for US corporate approval. Despite the company jumping through all the hoops it was asked to, the Biden admin cranked up the pressure, banning TikTok from all federal US devices in February 2023. The following month, TikTok CEO Sho Zi Chu was grilled by a panel of US politicians in a hearing more than a little reminiscent of McCarthy-era communist witch hunts. Chu came prepared with relevant data, including the correct assessment that US software has a clear track record of abusing user privacy while TikTok does not. But that sort of thing doesn't really matter when the panel isn't actually there to collect information. As TikTok spokesperson Brooke Overvetter reported to US media after the event, quote, the day was dominated by political grandstanding that failed to acknowledge the real solutions already underway. Two months later, in May 2023, we began to see the first state-level TikTok bans, with some more extreme than others. The state of Montana was on course to ban the app entirely, threatening ISPs with a $10,000 per day per violation fine for allowing the app to be downloaded. This law was set to go into effect January 1st, 2024, but it got shot down in federal court in November of 2023. And that just about brings us to today. On Wednesday, March 13th, the House passed a bill that will force TikTok to sell to US buyers within 165 days. It wasn't particularly close either, with 352 voting for the ban and just 65 against. What makes this bill particularly interesting is the speed with which it was discussed and sent to a vote. Because whenever they actually want to pass a bill, they can do it in, in three days. This is, what you don't, this is what people don't understand. If the Congress actually wants to pass a bill, they could do it in three days. They could do it faster than that, too, if they really, really want. But like when they're sitting and talking about a bill for months, it's because they want to talk about it for months. From introduction to floor vote took just four days. Funny how politicians will ban the world's most popular app in under a week, but won't give the American people affordable health care, or do anything about school shootings, or skyrocketing housing costs, or reproductive rights, or climate change, or the ongoing genocide in which they are complicit. Anyway, Biden has said he'll sign the bill if it passes in the Senate. So there we go, you're all caught up. The question now is, why? Oh shit, chat. This is cool. Jacqueline Phoenix, Elliot Gould, uh, Chloe Feynman, and more Jewish creatives support Jonathan Glazer's Oscar speech in an open letter. Joaquin, sorry, Joaquin Phoenix, sorry. Actually, cool people. Boots Riley. Deborah Winger. Room director Lenny Abramson. David Cross. Secrets and Lies Tour Mike Lee. Wallace Shawn. Hell yeah, brother. 
In a state with the variety, Ilana Glazer said, I signed this letter to help counter the climate of silencing that many workplaces and industries are facing around Israel's war on Gaza, now entering its seventh month. This controversy surrounding Jonathan Glazer is just one example. Added uh, Seamus, there's this, it has been weeks since Jonathan Glazer's accepted speech at the Academy Awards, but as we've been reminded by this week's unconscionable killing of seven World Center kitchen aid workers and of countless more Palestinian civilians, his plea for humanity has only become more urgent, as has our duty as Jewish creatives to protest the vicious smear campaign waged against him. We are Jewish artists, filmmakers, writers, and creative professionals who support Jonathan Glader's statement for the 2024 Oscars. We were alarmed to see some of our colleagues in the industry mischaracterize and denounce his remarks. Their attacks on Glazer are a dangerous distraction from Israel's escalating military campaign that has already killed over 32,000 Palestinians in Gaza and brought hundreds of thousands to the brink of starvation. We grieve for all of those who have been killed in is Palestine in Israel over too many decades, including 1,200 Israelis killed on the October 7th Hamas attacks and the 253 hostages taken. We honor the Holocaust by saying, never again for anyone. Let's go. Someone mentioned on Twitter that the original list was way longer, but the people on this list are way more famous. The other list was just fake. They just let you sign it. it wasn't even you like there, you could just sign it with Amanda Hug and Kiss. You know what I mean? Just like it was it was it was completely open. It wasn't vetted at all. It was all bullshit. It was a literal Google Doc. Why is the U.S. government so adamant about banning TikTok? It's like, wow, Ben they Dover the and Amanda Huggins signed this threatened letter. Threatened wow. If anything, we're economically dependent on China for the Michael cheap goods Hunt. that poorly paid Americans couldn't afford to buy otherwise. Not to mention the fact that if our government actually cared about data privacy, they'd crack down on Facebook or Oracle or Google or any number of other U.S. corporations that do the same exact thing they're accusing TikTok of doing. It should be clear to anyone paying attention that this was never about data security. So what is it about? Well, a couple of things. Let's start with one that would be funny if it weren't so scary. Those kids and their dang iPhones. What? Foreign adversary control of what is becoming the dominant news platform for Americans under 30. This is a common sense measure to protect our national security. I urge my colleagues to support this critical bipartisan legislation. The dominant news platform for Americans under 30. Let's unpack that. The United States relies on propaganda, like any other country, to ensure that its people are getting the information the ruling class wants them to get. In capitalist countries like the US, that propaganda is bought by lobbying groups and powerful corporations, laundered through corrupt politicians, and dutifully repeated on the corporate media and Silicon Valley social media apps. What does it mean for the status quo if the majority of Americans, and more critically, young Americans, entire generations of youth, are not getting their news from state-approved sources? That's a one-way ticket to unrest, to people getting fed up with how bad things have gotten, to protests and marches that the U.S. would rather not have to suppress. When the U.S. ruling class sees an app that is not owned by U.S. oligarchs and tech bros, it immediately becomes a threat because they can't curate the feeds. They can't tweak the algorithm to prefer State Department talking points. There's a reason Lenin said, give me just one generation of youth and I'll transform the whole world. Revolutionaries recognize that the youth are the future, and the best way to either enforce or break the status quo is to win the hearts and minds of the next generation. It Before people are fucking turned into cynical, self-interested shells of themselves. Before they have tried to change the world and failed, and become accepting of it, and then begin to benefit from it. It shouldn't come as a surprise that the most vocal supporters of Palestinian liberation are young people. They don't get fed pro-Israel propaganda on cable news, or Facebook, or in the New York Times. I made a video about the US media's complicity in the genocide a couple weeks ago. You can check that out if you'd like to see exactly how this consent manufacturing works. The bottom line in the media aspect of all this is that TikTok is the only widely used media platform that is not directly beholden to the US ruling class. 
In order to maintain the deeply inhumane and worsening status quo, the US regime must control every single aspect of what Americans consider news. But going back to the young people marching for change, that brings us to the second big reason the US is so eager to ban TikTok. It's becoming inconvenient for the foreign government that actually is meddling in US affairs. Israel. Israel. There it is. There it is. Remember Mike Gallagher, that guy you saw a couple minutes ago? The one complaining that the kids aren't consuming US propaganda? Would you like to venture a guess who his biggest contributors are? In the 2022 cycle, it was AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, a rabidly pro-Israel and incredibly powerful lobbying group that coincidentally also heavily funds Joe Biden, the man who for some reason can't bring himself to stop sending weapons to the rogue state committing the most obvious genocide in modern history. And it's not just these two. Almost every single US politician has accepted money from the Israel lobby. APAC Political Action Committee, APAC PAC, filed something called a Statement of Organization with the FEC just in time for the 2022 election cycle where it spent $50 million, including both direct contributions to candidates and outside spending like TV advertisements. According to APEC, it donated money to 365 candidates from both parties, including every single member of both Democratic and Republican leadership in Congress. We'll get back to the Israel lobby in a sec. But I'm sure that's good for us. I also want to highlight that Gallagher's biggest donor in the past election cycle. Hey, Chad, do you think that there's the... Uh, why isn't there the American Sweden? The American Swedish Public Affairs Committee, huh? How come there isn't the American Portuguese Public Affairs Committee? How come there isn't the American Can Canadian Public Affairs Committee giving 100 million? It's so odd that it's just Israel. Michael has been Palantir, the software company literally named after an evil orb used by dark forces to spy on people. <laughs> it shouldn't surprise you that Palantir, founded by Don't the notorious- Don't the Palantir, bro. Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel worked with the NSA to create the most comprehensive digital espionage apparatus ever conceived. Palantir was co-created with American spies. One of its earliest investors was the CIA, and the company will not disclose any of its contracts with the government, despite making over a billion dollars from these clandestine partnerships. Forgive me if I'm just a little skeptical about the intentions of this anti-spying bill, given that its main sponsor is funded by the world's largest spying machine. I feel like I need to get out some red string or something. This stuff goes deep. Anyway, back to the Israel lobby. Is and it even in string? It's just direct. The CIA wants to spy on everyone. The NSA wants to spy on everyone. What is their primary opponent of the United States? Is, uh, what do they fear the most? Any kind of social change. That means not just communism, but any kind of leftism. Even like social liberalism is really a threat. Because they might actually not be in favor of, I don't know, having ch child slaves. Before we go any further, I think it's important to put a little disclaimer here. There are bad actors online trying to weaponize the rightful criticism of Israel to push an anti-Semitic agenda. I'll put it bluntly. If you are one of those people, you will be banned from my comment section on site. You are not welcome here. You cannot equate Zionism with Judaism. The two have nothing to do with each other, as evidenced Zero by the X horrific treatment of devout Jews gift. at the hands of the fascist Zionist forces. The only reason some people are confused at the distinction is because it's convenient for the Israeli apartheid regime to conflate exactly. Zionism with Judaism, and therefore all their propaganda revolves around trying to get people to think that condemnation of Israel is the same as hatred of Jewish people. This will go down in history as some of the most damaging anti-Semitic propaganda ever devised, and we all need to reject it. All right, we all on the same page? Disclaimer over. Now let's take a look at how Israel is able to influence this TikTok legislation and why they're so desperate to do it. Here are some quick stats. TikTok has about 103 million active users in the US. More than one in three mobile internet users actively engage with the app. Half of the user base is between the ages of 10 and 29, and half the content creators are between 18 and 24. 
so you've got a massive user base which also skews quite young. Now look at this. Pro-Palestinian sentiment vastly, and I really mean vastly, outnumbers pro-Israel content. Millions of users, millions of posts, an endless stream of content cataloging and explaining Israel's crimes against humanity. If I'm an Israeli official and I see two whole generations of young people rightly condemning my fascist project, I'm gonna do everything in my power to shut down that platform. But don't just take it from me. Here's some leaked audio from a phone call with ADL Chief Executive Jonathan Greenblatt. I also want to point out that we have a major, major, major generational problem. All the polling I've seen, ADL's polling, ICC's polling, independent polling, suggests this is not a left-right gap, folks. The issue in the United States of support for Israel is not left and right. Now, chat, the Anti-Defamation League, what does that have to do with Israel? I thought that was an anti-hate group. I'm so confused. Why is it trying to defend a foreign government? It's almost as if, and this is a fact, the ADL is a Israeli spying front. It's a Mossad front. And it used to spend a lot of its time spying on apartheid, anti-apartheid protesters. These are all documented facts. ADL spied on anti-apartheid. In April, San Francisco police investigators searched two California offices of the Anti-Defamation League a respected civil rights organization that they suspected had been secretly monitoring the activities of thousands of political activists. They left with boxes of files a prosecutor later described in court as contraband, including leaked copies of confidential law enforcement reports, fingerprint cards, driver's license photographs, and individual criminal histories drawn from police records. They also seized pink copies of internal reports signed CAL. A code name, police have been told, for San Francisco art collector Roy H. Bullock. When a police questioned him, Bullock said he worked for 32 years as one of the ADL's chief intelligence gatherers on the West Coast, carefully, carefully following the movements of skinheads, white supremacists, Arab Americans, and critics of the Israeli government. Within the results of the searches were spelled out a detailed court affidavit and publicized, the ADL found itself involved in a heated debate with the civil rights community over its longtime intelligence gathering tactics. But the ADL's own documents and evidence made public in the San Francisco case suggests that Bullock was not engaged in occasional inquiries for the ADL. Rather, Bullock infiltrated political groups in San Francisco that were of continuing interest to the ADL and then submitted detailed reports that contained confidential police information, court records show. Former San Francisco police intelligence officer Thomas Gerard has been ch uh, charged in a complaint alleging that he gave confidential police information to Bullock. Gerard has pleaded not guilty. The investigation began last year after the FBI contained evidence that Bullock and Gerard sold information on anti-apartheid activists to intelligence agents of the South African government. Bullock said he gathered such information for the ADL, although the ADL says it was unaware of his dealings with the South Africans. He and Gerard split about 15000 in fees for the South African government court records show. FBI agents extensively interrogated Bullock, but did not file charges. See, it's okay if you spy on anti-apartheid activists and sell it to the racist government, chat. Police seized Bullock's home computer files and found a database of confidential information that traced back to Gerard and other police officers, as well as a box of old police intelligence files. 
San Francisco police that conducted a second interrogation of Bullock that produced a detailed first-person account of a life lived in the shadows of the subterranean Arab-Israeli conflict being waged on American soil. I was an investigator for the ADL, Bullock explained. I investigated any and all anti-democratic movements. His job, he told San Francisco police, was to gather political intelligence about groups the ADL considered anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. Hmm. History of information sharing with Israel. So in other words, the ADL is in a Mossad front that spies on Americans. And that is the reality of what it is. So are you surprised that they're going, we should ban TikTok for Israel? Who is Hutch and why does it matter he got roasted? Uh, he's, it's a liberal uh, video game streamer and it's hilarious to watch him get completely owned. He didn't know that the centrists are the ones who gave power to Hitler. For some reason he thought it was the communists or the socialists, but it was conservatives, industrialists, capitalists, and centrists, centrist liberals. <laughs> Fucking moron. Taglit, birthright Israel. Taglit, birthright Israel offers a free trip to Israel for Jewish young adults between the ages of 18 to 26. Sign up today. This is the propaganda thing. So you basically take American Jews when they're young and you, and you do them in a propaganda trip to Israel where you do an all expense paid vacation. So that American Jews feel like Israel is some sort of like uh, a personal um, connection. It's so weird that the head of the ADL is talking about an Israeli propaganda and brainwashing program. Again, here we have someone who understands that the next generation will be the determining factor in what the world looks like for the next 50 years. But instead of trying to advocate for positive change or an end to the genocide, the ADL and APAC and the rest of the Israel lobby is trying to shut down the people's ability to access vital information about the state of the world. They are actively trying to hide Israeli war crimes because it makes them look bad. So just in case I haven't been perfectly clear, there is a foreign government meddling in U.S. affairs. But it's not China, it's Israel. This bill was never about China supposedly spying on U.S. citizens. The government doesn't care about that. They haven't even provided any evidence to support their claims. This is just a clear example that the empire is spooked by a media outlet they don't control, they want to force the company to sell so that they can control it, and the process is being expedited because the Israel lobby has enormous sway in our political machinery. Money, corruption, the maintenance of empire. That's all this is. True. And so there are a few main takeaways from this whole TikTok saga. First, the United States wants to make sure it has a monopoly on collecting and selling our data, as well as a complete control over our media landscape. Second, a genocidal apartheid regime is blatantly meddling in our affairs to prevent- Yeah, I mean, basically, America is so riddled with Israeli spies that they're in the White House. ...and people from- ADL supports Israel. ADL thinks anti-Zionism anti is anti-Semitism. Bro. Israel doesn't even allow. Israel doesn't even allow gay marriages. I'm opposing the genocide. And third, any time the government tells you they can't move quickly on an issue, they are lying through their teeth. From introduction to vote to the president promising to sign the bill in less than a week. 
they can pass whatever they want. It just so happens that will never be what we want. They'll move quickly. The for process was secret and the bill was jammed through for one reason. It's a ban. Or were to cover for genocide, but they won't protect our children in school. They won't codify reproductive rights. They won't do anything about climate change. This is the bottom line when we're talking about capitalist regimes. The dominance of capital is always, 100% of the time, the thing that gets government action. APAC money? Great. Fossil fuel money? Great. Pharmaceutical money? Great. Improving Basically, the lives- Basically, APAC was started because there was a major- uh, Israel did a huge massacre, and it looked really bad in the media, and they were like, huh. We need to have a PR. We need to get Madison Avenue on our side. And that's when APAC was founded. To help cover up the slaughter of innocents. ...of their people? Walking back from the brink of nuclear war? Stopping a genocide? Not a chance. I always end these videos with a call to action to get organized. Join a socialist organization. Build dual power structures and class consciousness. Mass mobilization is the only thing that's worked in the past, and it's the only thing that'll work today. But I also want people to really think about the world we're living in. This isn't me as a YouTuber trying to make a cool video anymore. This is me as a human being living in 2024 with you. What's it going to take to get Americans to open their eyes to the fact that we are living in a violent, decaying empire that does not care whether we live or die? As long as the ruling class can still squeeze out a profit, they will keep this machine churning until the wheels fall off and we're all crushed. I'm asking you as a person now. Please, follow one of the links in the description and join some socialist organization. I don't care which one. Go to some meetings, platform. see what you think, and then come back to the comments. I mean, this is my attitude as well. I'm, I'm a platformist. Uh, I just try to get you to do get involved. But maybe, maybe, maybe that'll have to change soon. Comments here and tell me which one you chose and what projects your chapter is working on. That's the only way we build a world that is better than the one we've got now. At the end of the day, we're all just people. The ones in charge, the ones banning apps, cracking down on our rights to protest, committing a genocide, they're just people. We outnumber them thousands of times over. They know that, and their main objective is to make sure you don't know that. Well, now you do. What are you gonna do about it? You're going to get involved, right now, today. All right. Are you happy that you made that endorsement in 2020? Are you happy with the state of America? Am I happy with the state of America right now? Well, that answer is no. Do I believe we're going to get better? I, I believe in that. I'm an optimistic guy, and I, I believe we can get better. Um, the endorsement that I made uh, years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at that time. And I thought back then, when we talk about, hey, you know, I, I'm in this position uh, where I have some influence and it's my job then, I felt like that then, it's my job now to exercise my influence and share with this, this is who I'm going to endorse. Am I going to do that again this year? That answer is no. Are you happy that you made that endorsement in 2020? Are you happy with this? He lost the rock. He's lost the rock. And there you have it, chat. They want to ban TikTok because Israel, Israel's lobbyists want to ban because they want the youth to be propagandized that genocide is okay. It is what it is, and this horrible thing happened. And what I said very plainly is get it over with and let's get back to peace and stop killing people. And that's a very simple statement. Get it over with. They got to finish what they finish. They just have to get it done. Get it over with and get it over with fast because we have to, you have to get back to normalcy and peace. The whole world is blowing up with this idiot president we have. He's an idiot. He's, he's the dumbest president we've ever had. He's the most corrupt and he's the most incompetent. And he's the worst president we've ever had by a fact. You know, I say, and you've listened to plenty of them, if you add up the 10 worst presidents in history, they haven't done the damage that this guy's done to our country. What he's done at the border with allowing probably 15 million people by this time into our country and plenty more coming, 
Uh, it's just insane. What, what they have done to our country in three and a half years is unbelievable. But you are still standing 100 percent with Israel. You, you achieved the Abraham Accords, which was the first peace deal since right. Sadat. And so are you still 100 percent with Israel? And what's your advice to Netanyahu beyond get it over with in a hurry? Well, that's all the advice you can give. I mean, that's the advice. You've got to get it over with and you have to get back to normalcy. And I'm not sure that I'm loving the way they're doing it because you got to have victory. You have to have a victory. And it's taking a, a long time. And the other thing is I hate they put out tapes all the time. Every night they're releasing tapes of a building falling down. They shouldn't be releasing tapes like that. They're doing that's why they're losing the PR war. They, Israel is absolutely losing the PR war. That's how I, I read your interview. That. I read your interview as saying they're losing the PR war. They've got to stop releasing bad video and win the they're war releasing, by going into Rafa. They're releasing the most heinous, most horrible tapes of buildings falling down. Hugh Hewitt and, is uh, somebody MSNBC hired to try to uh, make have a show, literally. MSNBC wants to be right wing so bad. People are imagining there's a lot of people in those buildings or people in those buildings and they don't like it. And I don't know why they release, you know, wartime shots like that. I guess it makes them look tough. But to me, it doesn't make them look tough. They're losing the PR war. and They're losing it big. And this is kind of I mean, so he didn't agree with Hewitt about going into Rafa. And this is the thing about Trump. Trump doesn't, Trump is got a simple brain. But in some aspects, that simple brain allows him to be better at politics than Biden because he can say, hey, I can tell the vibes are off. Israel, you're ruining the vibes. Biden has just gotten, he's so out of touch. But that being said, chat, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is incredible. No wonder, no wonder Destiny loves uh, Biden. No wonder Destiny is, the, is a big Biden fun, uh, uh, supporter. Biden claims his own wife hates his Israel policy. many Muslims decline invite and if you read the article they say that several Muslim Americans declined to go in protest of Joe Biden's support for Israel's war on Gaza right the sources who spoke to Al Jazeera on condition of anonymity and this reporting is backed up by Washington Post and other outlets as well said the cancellation on Tuesday came after those Muslim community members warned leaders against attending the White House meal quote the American Muslim community said very early on it would be completely unacceptable for us to break bread with the very same White House that is en enabling the Israeli government to starve and slaughter the Palestinian people in Gaza. Both CNN and NPR had previously reported the White House was preparing a community iftar, so they had planned to do this and had to back out of it when they couldn't get anyone outside of their own staffers to attend. Hours later on Tuesday, the White House announced instead it would be hosting a meal for Muslim government staffers and holding a separate meeting with a few Muslim American community figures. Um, apparently that meeting that was held did not go particularly well based on the reports of those who participated in the meeting. Um, here is one doctor who said, that he was forced to walk out of the meeting because he was uh, so disgusted with the Biden administration. Let's listen to his explanation. You know, we had shown up to this meeting really concerned about what was taking place in the Gaza Strip. And I'm glad that you mentioned that we were, you know, insisting that there not be any food there. It made no sense for us to sort of break bread while talking about a famine taking place. Um, we had shown up and the president and the vice president, the national security advisor are in the room. And it was very brief comments by the president saying he wants to hear from us and he wants to listen to us. And so I spoke first and I let him know that I am from a community that's reeling. We are grieving and we, our heart is broken for what's been taking place over the last six months. And that the rhetoric that has been coming out of the Biden administration, that's been coming out of the White House, it's frustrated a lot of people, especially people who are Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. We are not satisfied with what has taken place. There has been no concrete steps. 
But keep in mind, we're very concerned about the people that are over in the Gaza Strip that are in Palestine right now, who are not just starving, but are facing the threat of a looming Rafah invasion. And so I was able to share that with the president and let him know that out of respect for my community, out of respect for all of the people who have suffered and who have been killed in the process, I need to walk out of the meeting. And I want to walk out uh, with decision makers and let them know what it feels like uh, for somebody to say something and then walk away from them and not hear them out and not hear their response. Wow. I mean, what did, how did President Biden respond to that? You know, there wasn't a lot of response. He actually said that he understood. And I walked away. So uh, pretty extraordinary for that to be, that interview to be occurring on CNN. Also, um, NBC News had additional reporting of some of the commentary from inside of the meeting, other indications this did not go particularly well. Another doctor, I can put this up on the screen, who attended, was taken aback when she showed Biden prints of photos of malnourished children and women in Gaza, to which Biden responded, he had seen those images before. The only problem, the doctor said, was that she had printed those photos from her own B iPhone. B-boy is so there was no way. Thank you for the 50 gifted sub. All right, well, chat, we're going to have to chill now. It's early. It's only two hours of the stream. But if you enjoy this content, then please consider supporting the stream by subscribing at Tier 1, Tier 2, or Tier 3 sub. If you have Amazon Prime, you can attach that to your Twitch account. You get one free sub a month. Hold on. Give me a second. I'm going to try to lower my difficulty. Does anybody know where the difficulty level of hype trains is? I want to lower the difficulty of my hype train. There it is. I found it. Hype train settings. I'm making it fucking easy, baby. Let's see how high we can go. There you go. Did I, I started it? Let's fucking go. Let's see how high we can go, bitch. We got a 50 gifted sub bomb. We might as well. We're at level six already. Let's fucking go. They made a new tier from Pirate Software. Yeah, that Pirate Software is like the perfect Twitch streamer to make money on Twitch. He is a gaming programmer nerd. And so he basically he's a he's a whale magnet. He's a whale magnet. No one's ever going to compete. Why are you hating? Is being a nerd hating? I I'm a nerd. Is being a nerd hating? Saying no one can compete with somebody is hating? I guess I'm just an East Coaster. I'm not used to how soft everybody is when he, like, you know what I mean? Like, Jesus Christ. Meow Tain Cat, Dumb Pitch Pudding, Rusty Bikes, White Yummy Bear, Chirpum, Top Scruffy, Meow Tain Cat. Look at that. What level are we at already, chat? What level did we get to? We're going to break an all-time record because I lowered... The difficulty was hard before and I lowered it to easy. This is like going from uh, hell dive to trivial. Which reminds me, I need to exploit... I need to exploit the trip. There's a you want to guys want to hear a, a hell dive to exploit. If you change the difficulty to trivial, you can like do um you can drop down and there's a, a lot there's not any samples inside of like uh, POIs because you're like too low of a level to get rare samples. So it means that they roll more super credits in the POIs. Hilariously, and you could do those missions really quick, or you could like all F4 after you explore the whole map and get all the super credits, you could all F4 and go back to the same map. So you, all, you have every single, you'll know where every POI is. And because it's a low level, 
you're rolling more super credits and you can farm thousands of super credits. I farmed a couple thousand that way. Stop, don't, know. We're gonna patch it. It's already known. There's already been YouTube videos about it. I figured I'd tell my chat before it gets patched. I just buy super credits to support the developers. Fuck you. I paid $60. I gave my money. And the game sometimes crashes. So I'll be do and they don't have a reconnect. You know what? You know what Helldivers 2 needs more than anything? A reconnect feature. I'll be hosting a game. We'll do the entire shit. And then a game will crash. 40 minutes of, of progress lost. Reconnect works as if you have friends. Yeah, if you're, if you're playing with your friends. But not if you're like hosting a game with randos. By the way, reconnecting with your friends actually doesn't work because it, you're not the host anymore. Somebody else is the host. So it's broken. Mike on my way to Chicago for the weekend. Any recommendations? Chicago is the city I know the least. I would say is don't eat that disgusting casserole they call pizza. That's my only suggestion. <laughs> I'm kidding. I would eat. I would totally eat. I would totally eat deep dish if I went to Chicago. I would drown in that sauce. I would drown in that sauce. That would be the hot tub stream. Me climbing into a Chicago deep dish pizza. Gene and Jude's hot dogs are a must. Okay, there you go, chatter. Azra Loza, thank you for the tier one. All right, let's get back to the video chat. Well, oh, fuck, we have a hype trade. We're at level eight. We're at 176 subs. Let's fucking go. How high can we get? How high can we get, chat? We are at, let's, I mean, like, come on. We did a level 10 the other day, so we got the first tier. Also, chat, what are the emotes? What are the emotes you get for being in, a, in the hype train thing? I have, like, I, I think I have them all, right? Which hype train? What is the, like, the big, what is, like, the, the big one? I don't know, I was there. I gave, I gave Pirate Software 200 bitch just to be part of it. What leftist doesn't love trades, folks? Solidarity forever, Mike and chat that make this community so powerful. Thank you, Zephyr Calling, for the tier three. Cuban Silky, thank you for the tier one. Frequency, uh, thank you for the prime. Appreciate you. I'm really high right now. Nice. Here's the emotes. Okay, chat. We're pausing the news to look at hype train emotes. Oh, fuck. Oh, I do have it. I do have it. See? There it is.
Look, I have Kappa Infinite. See that? Look at that. Look at that, chat. You want Kappa Infinite? You have to give me uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's go. All right, let's keep going. Way he could have seen those photos before Sagar, which right. speaks both Spy to the girl, fact that you know to him. Okay, all chat, the we're at level nine. We're at level nine. We're almost at the first level of Twitch hype rewards. We're almost there, level ten. This is all you get. Thank you for the prime. Appreciate you. Starving Gazans that he'd say, oh, it was all the same. And it also speaks to like an age befuddlement issue as well. So you got a double whammy there. Um, and but I, I think it, just, it speaks to what we were discussing earlier, which is just, you know, to him, Israelis are full human beings that he has full empathy for and Palestinians are not. And, you know, the only reason he's at this height of anger, but still not changing his policy, by the way, right E7. now is because he has a personal Ch connection to Jose Chinto. Andres. But Thank you, all of these images of starving children, children who are be buried under rubble, you know, body parts strewn about a hospital courtyard, none of this is really landing for him. It's not really impacting him, certainly not in the way that Avatar the- Avatar Moon Lily, thank you for the 200 bits. Chat, we are dangerously close. Rusty Bikes, we have one minute and 30 seconds. Tier nine. VG Hero, thank you for the five tier ones. We're halfway there. Yeah, uh, the doctor doesn't realize is that uh, uh, Biden had see had had uh, the NSA hack her phone, so she had see he had seen the video. He thought it was a private video, but in fact, the NSA was already spying. Thirty-three years, Pog. I hope. You're setting aside a time to enjoy SOD part three algorithm. Thank you for the 33 months. Heidi Hakuro, thank you for the five tier ones. And Luna Lockless, thank you for the 10 tier ones. And Vordor, thank you for the five tier ones. I haven't, I haven't done any. All I did was a raid yesterday and got the level from that, but I didn't do shit. Manufacturer, thank you for the five tier ones. Let's go. We have 30 seconds, chat. Delta Machine gave 10. Let's fucking go. All right. Staggy Foot, thank you for the 11 months. Barbie McDonald, thank you for the tier one. And Kay Schumann, thank you for gifting us up. And Dusty Old Hog, thank you for the 22 months. Look at that. Everybody bleeds purple. Or do you have to finish level 10? Do you have to finish level 10? You have to fit. Oh, fuck. You have to finish level 10. Ah, oh, shit. Boring house. Thank you for the five tier one. Ah, oh, god damn it. I debated you. Obi-Wan, thank you for the 400 bits. Substitute scholar. Thank you for the tier two. Why do you have a golden kappa hype train? Why do you have a golden kappa? Who had a golden kappa hype train? Dr. Brainslug gave 50 gifted subs! We're not at level 10 yet. Oh no! Chirpa, thank you for the five tier. We were so close! <laughs> Vio got another? That's her eighth one! Mr. Tadpole with a five gifted subs. Violins against the rich. Cash Sky at the 500 bits. Maui Wowies, Charlie Hickbot, Dota Special with the five, K Shuba with a gift and sub, Byron Cappy. Okay, chat, we have officially unlocked Bleed Purple HD. If you subscribe right now, you will get Bleed Purple HD. Give, if you sub, resub, give a Twitch Prime, gift at least one sub, or use at least 200 bits, you will get the Bleed Purple HD. Twitch emote, site wide. R ridiculous, thank you for the five. Round brow, thank you for the five. Ma Mad Maple Syrup, thank you for the gift. Riders on the Storm, thank you for the tier one. The Boring House, Sonder TP, Gangao, 
Lakoros, Acid Burns, Chica. Thank you for the 10 tier ones. Wizard of Oi, thanks for the 200 bits. Can we bend the knee for the 10, uh, the people who gift 10 subs, please, chat? Crunk Ops, Yarn Dragon, Professor Daniel, K Schumann, Zero Glow Cat, Fat Loser, Madu Basaya, Black Goo Suku. Thank you for the five tier ones. Z Zerkley, Dark Divination, Oik Moik. Thank you all. Red Edge, Rebel Scum with the five, with the gifted. Bizarre Logo with the two. Thank you, Bizarre. You don't have to give subs. Generic Name. Thank you for the gifted subs. Tony DeTaco. Holy shit! This is great. We're at 368. This is fucking great. I love reading everybody's names. Kelly86. Everybody's got a name. 369. Were you napping? Can I wake you up? Fucker, how are you gonna scream at the top of your lungs when it's not even a golden kappa hype train? Get on my level, bitch. How many gold how many gold kappa hype trains have you gotten? Not enough. Not enough. It's bullshit. I got like two, and B was like, "It's not fair. You had two. I haven't had any." And since then, V has had eight golden kappa hype trades. Eight golden kappa hype trades. Eight. Nine. I haven't even had one since Nine. then. Nine. She was bawling her eyes out. Nine. Because she had eight golden kappa. Nine. Skill issue TBH. I think I think Vio is hacking the website. I am. Anonymous gifter. Thank you. Son uh, Nano Lionheart twenty three fifty three. A Smitty. T Sammy. Don Sidbo with the five sidelined virtue. Jesse Jalapeno. Rattlehead. Other TP, Cuban 34 Silky, Ori, Canadians are sorry. They're not. Sonder TP, Karina. Thank you, everybody. We are at 398 subs. That's too short. That please hit 420. <laughs> nice shirt. Who'd you steal that from? Are you a Hasanabi head? I mean, good question. Good question. Good question. This is, that's a really good question. I got this victory down the list. Ragdolled around. There was like a couple minutes where I couldn't play my character because I was getting ragdolled. <laughs> yeah, by the laser I was, turn. Yeah, I was like, where yeah. the fuck is my character at? By the way, chat, Mike from PA. Nesua, we're alive. Helldivers extracted. Carter and, ha and Hasanabi failed to extract. Kills. Just in here. Don't live without me. It's not it's just lying there. I'm coming. Or I'll create a. I got dinner reservations at the Olive Garden. Oh, my wife. My wife. 
All right. Okay. Let's get back to actual content. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the stream. Geek or Geek Greg, L Fudge, the elusive gay foot, Toddsworth, Pecan D34, J Stops, Dev Brax. Thank you, everybody. Remember, chat. If you want your Bleed Purple HD, you need to sub, gift a sub, a prime sub, or at least 200 bits. I will give you five subs if you get a visible, visible man bun over your headset and keep it. That sounds like too much work. Atrocities committing committed on October seventh did. Delta and There's one other interesting you. piece of reporting okay, um, that I just content. saw this morning even, from even this chilling. meeting, We're at which is according to what Joe Biden said inside of this meeting. How do I refund? I can't afford fifty subs. You can't. You can't. You can't. As far as I, I mean, maybe you can call Twitch. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure you can't. So thank you. Thanks for the 50 subs. Do you want to try this? Damn. It's something. Non-refundable. No refunds. His own wife has begged him to stop this war saying, quote, stop it, stop it now. Um, this is from a report in the New York Times, again, per Joe Biden and what he said in this meeting. So interesting that even his own wife potentially is um, very distressed by what she is seeing coming out of the Gaza Strip and begging him to put an end to it. And Jill Biden herself has faced, you know, plenty of protesters True, when definitely. she's tried to go out go, and campaign Chad. as well. So, you know, those people who are out there, activists who are forced. 411 subs. And 4,500 bits. Let's fucking go. Saying Jill Biden, Joe Biden, Karine Jean-Pierre, all of these officials to have to reckon with what they're doing and what they're enabling every single day, potentially having an impact here on Jill Biden, at least. Yeah, I think it, uh, this is definitely significant. The fact is, is that, I mean, this is part of what is annoying, too. It's like, if they're like, it's a Mike, Muslim problem. It's not just Muslims, you know, <laughs> that object to this. They... In general, from what we can see, is that I think that he, in particular, has this emotional connection, plus he's stubborn, plus he's old, and it's a media issue where, at the end of the day, you know, Biden doesn't even live in reality. He lives in MSFBC. basically like 1990s America. He watches a little bit of cable news, a little bit, and then he reads like hardcover newsprint. That's not how the vast majority of people are experiencing news around this conflict. And I think that when you think, you know, considering that Ooh. informs the worldview that he brings to this, and it also, I think, probably informs us as to just why he is so steadfast and refusing to change the policy, even if his advisors may tell him different. He's a stubborn old man. He's not going to listen to them. He is I think that's a huge part of it. Completely ideologically yeah. committed to Zionism, period. End of story. Yeah, true. It is. He's willing to risk it all. To Elusive maintain that commitment. I mean, at this point, There's I don't think you can really come up with any. Do other. not give people money. Because they joked they couldn't afford it. Okay? They can't afford it. It went through. Okay? Don't you dare try to give someone money through fucking Twitch chat. That's not me. Welcome, Mafia Jinx Raiders. It's Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. <laughs> Don't pay the chatters. Pay me. Uh, Mafia Jinx. Thank you for the raid. Everybody follow Mafia Jinx. This is my good pal, my good friend. Mike, what are your thoughts on the analysis on Western leftists? I, I don't care. I don't care. I think that's one of the most annoying thing people do on Twitter. Western leftists are so cringe. 
is a Western leftist. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, shut up. Shut the fuck up. Sergeant Sage, thank you for the tier one. Another explanation because you have so many members of his administration leaking at this point that they're upset with the direction of the policy you've got. He's lost Morning Joe. He lost the Pod Save Bros. He lost Jose Andres. He's losing the UK. Doesn't matter. And, you know, we continue to have significant uncommitted vote. There was a larger uncommitted vote in Wisconsin this week than, you know, the size of his margin against Trump last time around. There was reporting about how Biden himself is seeing the poll numbers as upset about how much of an impact this is having on his reelection prospects. We've t brought to you so many polls about how the Democratic base is disgusted with this policy, but he apparently mm -hmm. doesn't care. None of it really lands. Even his own, he's even lost his own wife, apparently, and even that isn't having any sort of a real impact. There you go. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com. I always dislike this point. Biden is ideologically concerned with one thing, his legacy. He's mistakenly gambled on Israel's future being part of that legacy or coinciding with it. I don't think he's a genuine Christian or Zionist. He just thinks those things make him look good. He is, I don't, I mean, debating whether Biden is evil or stupid, I don't care. I don't care. If somebody is doing something because they're mistaken or because they're legitimately uh, uh, uninformed, I don't care. I want them to stop. It's like you're riding down the highway. And somebody is just spewing shit out of their truck bed onto the, onto the road. I don't care whether he was a reckless dipshit or he just didn't know how to secure the load. I'm going to get that guy to stop. Why he's stupid, why he's an asshole doesn't matter to me at that point. And that's the way it is with Biden. I don't care whether he's a stupid asshole or an evil asshole. We're going to do what we can to pressure him. The Leave It Blank campaign gets 12% of the vote in the New York City Democrat or New York, excuse me, Democratic presidential primary. In New York City, 15% of Democratic primary voters did not vote for any of the three candidates on the ballot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ugh. God. And that brings us to good news? Good news? Joe Biden has successfully pressured Israel to open up more aid deliveries after threatening their support. I'm Gerhard Elfes. Welcome to the program. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office has announced the temporary opening of a border crossing to allow aid into Gaza. The opening of the Erez crossing into the Palestinian territories north was among several steps approved by Israel's cabinet to increase the flow of humanitarian assistance. The news was welcomed in Washington, where President Joe Biden had earlier told Netanyahu in a phone call that further U.S. support for Israel's war in Gaza depended on such steps. Biden also said Israel must take more action to prevent civilian deaths. Relations between the two allies have soured since Monday's killing of seven aid workers in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Speaking at a NATO meeting in Brussels, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called on Israel to do more to protect civilians and allow access to humanitarian aid. We need to see an immediate ceasefire to enable the release of hostages, but also to enable um, a, a dramatic surge in humanitarian assistance, uh, as well as obviously better protecting uh, civilians. Now, uh, as I said, the president and the prime minister just spoke, but it's uh, our expectation that um, Israel uh, will and certainly should announce concrete, specific, measurable steps that uh, it will take and take as soon as possible. Uh, to make sure that there can be an effective surge in assistance, that it can be sustained, uh, and that humanitarian workers and civilians are better protected. 
DW correspondent Tanya Kramer joins us now from Jerusalem. Tanya, what more can you tell us about these, these new steps to let aid into Gaza? I thought it was all open, chat. I thought Israel wasn't blocking anything. I guess they were, after all. I guess they're new, after all. My dude last night tried to tell me that there's no such thing as a good Zionist because I called Biden evil for being a Zionist. That, oh, try to tell me there's such a thing as a good Zionist. No, there's not. <laughs> to be a Zionist is the same thing as to be a white supremacist. You want to have a Jewish state. Can you imagine what we would think of somebody who says, I want to have a Christian state or I want to have a white state? Why can't Alabama be the white Christian state? Why can't we just deny black people rights? It's our, it's our land. It's the same logic. Remember, Israel was founded in 1948, chat. America didn't really become a pluralistic democracy until the 70s. And many people are probably objecting right now, going, Mike, what about the Civil Rights Acts and the Voting Rights Acts of 64 and 65? My response to that is, what year was interracial marriage legal? What year do we legalize interracial marriage in America? It wasn't fucking 1965. What year did Virginia reopen their public schools? What year did Virginia reopen their public schools? They shut down their public schools. This is the reality. America was virulently racist. That is the reality. Well, as you said, this announcement uh, by the Israeli cabinet came uh, after this phone call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin uh, Netanyahu. And I think the most significant, as you said, is the reopening, at least uh, for some time, uh, of the Eris uh, crossing. That is a crossing in the north that has been in the past used by humanitarian workers, but also by journalists. We went through there uh, going into Gaza, diplomats and also uh, Palestinian patients uh, going out uh, from Gaza. Uh, Gaza. Uh, this is significant because uh, when you cross uh, the Eris crossing, uh, it takes uh, by car about uh, 10 minutes uh, to reach the outskirts of uh, Gaza City, passing the town of Beit Hanun. And uh, of course, right now we're expecting that you know the infrastructure and roads are heavily damaged, but this will have to be taken care of, and it would help uh, those aid convoys. Uh, aid organizations have said you know they rarely go into uh, the north of Gaza. Be if, uh, of because of various reasons, uh, they could be uh, now various reaching reasons, uh, the chat. area uh, much uh, faster. Various reasons. Like Israel will murder you. That is a free fire zone. It is very important because, especially in northern Gaza, the situation is critical for the people uh, that have uh, remained there. In addition to that, uh, the cabinet announced that more humanitarian aid would be going through the Ashdod port, the Israeli port, which is also close uh, to, uh, in close proximity by road uh, to the Ares crossing in the north of Gaza, and also that more humanitarian aid would be coordinated through Jordan via the land route, and then going through Kerem Shalom. Now, this, of course, looks, first of all, good on paper. Now, of course, it needs to be seen, you know, how much uh, this will actually increase the aid and delivery also of commercial goods going into Gaza in the coming days. Uh, this followed uh, Biden's call with Netanyahu, in uh, which Biden also called for an immediate ceasefire. Will Israel listen to that? Well, I think, I mean, it's a bit in the wording, and I think we've seen here uh, in this call, we understand from American officials that uh, US President Joe Biden was very upset what happened uh, to the aid workers of- Oh, did the white people dying make him suddenly gain empathy? 
As white people dying suddenly let Biden realize that Israel is out of control? Uh, the world central kitchen, you know, in, in, in the tone and as indicating that there could be a change in a U.S. policy uh, with respect to Gaza, as was uh, written in the readout of this call. It will be determined, it said, uh, quote, by the assessment of Israel's immediate action, immediate action uh, on these steps. And uh, we heard also uh, U.S. Secretary Blinken uh, before, uh, you know, they made it clear they need to be specific and concrete and measurable, measurable uh, steps for the civilian population, uh, but also uh, to protect uh, uh, um, the aid workers working in Gaza, in addition to calling for an immediate ceasefire and to come to a conclusion uh, in these hostage talks. We'll have, we'll have to wait and see if, if this will have any impact. Our correspondent, Tanya Kramer, there reported from Jerusalem. Thank you, Tanya. Now, let's bring in Jules Tiltermann. He's the Middle East Programme Director at the International Crisis Group, and he joins us from Brussels. Uh, Jules, more aid uh, to come to Gaza. Are you optimistic, or is it just good on paper? Well, I'm optimistic that, in fact, uh, more aid will come to Gaza, uh, but um, I'm not optimistic in the sense that it's still way too little. Uh, Gaza is facing uh, and is already undergoing, in parts, uh, famine. Uh, people are starving uh, to death, uh, and um, the aid that is trickling in is really far, in, far too insufficient. Wow, this is German news. Holy shit. This is German liberal news. Uh, the tide is really turning. To take care of all the people who are in desperate need of food. So, yes, it's a step forward, but it's really not enough. Uh, do you think that Israel has succumbed to the pressure from the U.S. to protect civilians better? Well, succumbed is too strong a word for me. I think Israel is giving in to some pressure, uh, to some of the pressure, in order to uh, increase very gradually, very slowly, uh, and very minimally uh, aid to, to starving Palestinians. Um, but uh, more pressure will be needed uh, and maybe some more some some more concrete action on the part of the United States uh, in order to uh, press Israel to to completely open up the uh, the territory to the kind of aid to the kind of volumes of aid that are now required. Now, given all this pressure, do you think we'll see Israel scale down its Gaza operations uh, because it fears that more mistakes could alienate them from their partners even further? You know, it's a very difficult thing because I think Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't want to end the war in Gaza short of having destroyed Hamas, which has been the war objective from the very beginning. And in a way, the United States agrees with that objective, but not at the cost of destroying Gaza and its population. And I think Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't necessarily care so much about what happens uh, to the population. So it's a very difficult balance for him now. He may have to scale down, but he doesn't want to end it. Uh, and so he's in a bind. And I think he also believes that the longer he can keep the war going, uh, the more secure his own position is as prime minister. And I think from, from his part- Because he's being charged with the corruption. There are criminal charges hanging over Netanyahu's head for corruption. The moment he loses the immunity of being the prime minister, he'll go to jail. So yeah, he's, he's going to genocide as many people as it takes and take the maximalist approach to this war. And the fact that Joe Biden supported this is absolutely baffling. President Biden is trying to squeeze him so that he eventually will have to step down uh, and a new government will come in place in Israel that will be a little bit more amenable to U.S. pressure. Well, that leads, leads me straight to my next question. As you mentioned, Netanyahu has been under pressure from several sides, both inside and outside of Israel. Uh, and there also have been calls for snap parliamentary elections and even for his removal. Uh, is either of that likely to happen? Well, the thing is, uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's popularity has taken a nosedive um, compared with some of the other uh, candidates who were there. But that said, um, his uh, coalition still has majority support in Parliament. So whatever, regardless of his personal popularity, uh, will be difficult 
uh, to uh, move to elections when he still enjoys a majority. So something else would have to happen to, to trigger that. Uh, now, uh, clearly the Israeli population is asking for new elections, so or parts of the population. So we'll have to see uh, whether that pressure builds to the point that actually they would trigger uh, that. Your Silderman there, the Middle East Programme Director at the International Crisis Group. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Chat, I, I just can't get over this. I can't get over this story. China has flooded the market with so many solar panels that people are using them as garden fencing. They're not as that cheap in America. How do we get those solar... You know what would be a wise thing to do? You know what would be a wise thing to do for the government to say, okay, look at the prices and say, we will buy all the panels we can get at this price and just start installing them and and energy co-op set up a government program to give everybody free solar panels on their roof if they want it and just buy these cheap panels and be like all right thanks and just take them and install them over every single walmart parking lot every target parking lot Every single fucking Sam's Club or Costco parking lot should be shaded with solar panels. We should be plastering solar panels everywhere and taking these cheap solar panels and using them and saying, thanks for making our energy cheap, China. Thanks for reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, China. Right now, oil is almost $90 a barrel. And they're saying it's solar panels are too cheap? Have you seen my electric bill? I just installed solar. It was 17K and it came to 12K after IRA credits. Still too expensive. I mean, you're going to end up paying yourself back in three years. Probably. It's probably going to pay itself back in three years. And then you're going to have free electricity. They're ugly, though. Have you seen a parking lot? Have you seen a parking lot? Have you seen an asphalt shingle roof? I actually tend to think that uh, solar panels are quite attractive compared... Now, you know, uh, solar panels on Mediterranean, sh you, know, ting you know, or this, like, this Spanish-style shingles doesn't look that great to me, but... Like, this is crazy. <sighs> Those tiles are also very hard to fit solar panels on. Pain in the ass. Yeah, I, I know. My job is doing energy assessments and figure out proper solar designs to maximize our home's energy efficiency and my state offers zero incentives or rebates for solar just for home installation and mini splits. Oh my lord. I know you hate Tusk and Tesla and Musk, but thoughts on the solar titles? I don't think they're actually available. Hi, my name is Marquez Brownlee and I have not paid for electricity in a year. I have a bunch of electrical appliances, computers, game console, TVs, air conditioning, and I drive an electric car to and from work every single day and charge at home. Zero dollar bill. So I know I had a lot of questions about how this stuff worked, how much it cost, how this much- This guy it is like the, the Tesla simp, right? Like did he got his, he got to start like being the big Tesla simp. paperwork with the towns for a race size your boy's got a big roof and then there are three power walls i feel like that's really the only way to explain three power how walls? this motherfucker's got like a 60k system into it so first of all the specs right so this is a 29.313 kilowatt solar array size your boy's got a big roof 
And then there are three Powerwall 3s, which totals 40 and a half kilowatt hours. And then this is the Tesla app where all of the learnings and all of the numbers happen. When the system first got activated, I just remember like seeing it light up in the app for the first time, the numbers jump up and just kind of you just kind of get, I could stare at the app for a while. Like I could really get lost in the numbers. Maybe it's just because I'm a numbers person, but there's a lot going on and that's, it was exciting to see it all in real time and learn a lot of stuff. So I think the app is really well done and it lets you visualize how much energy the solar array is currently capturing, how much energy the home is using and the state of charge and power output or input of the power wall batteries. And then of course, anything happening with the electrical grid. So you can see at this exact moment in time on a sunny morning in July, the panels are bringing in seven kilowatts of power, five of which are powering the house, the last two of which are going into the power walls, which are 38% full, and it's not touching the grid at all. There's already a lot of terms being thrown around here. Here's a good way of thinking about it. Kilowatts is a measure of power, so one kilowatt is a thousand watts. Uh, a kilowatt hour, though, is a unit of energy collected. So a Tesla Model S battery, for example, is 100, roughly 100 kilowatt hours. And so if that battery were to output 100 kilowatts for an hour, then it would be at zero. So for my setup, the Powerwall 3, each one is about 13 and Why a half. Why are Tesla Powerwalls so fucking small and expensive? Kilowatt hours each. So that totals 40 and a half kilowatt hours. I would definitely not get Powerwalls. I think they're massively overpriced. Since I have three and they support a maximum power output in or out of 15 and a half kilowatts. And then the solar system being 29.3 kilowatts means that basically it seems like the theoretical maximum of the electricity that can be collected at any one time is 29.3 kilowatts. But as you're about to see a little bit later, that number may or may not be accurate. Either way, just hanging out in the Tesla app for a while, which you do a lot for the first few weeks, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what takes a lot of energy, what takes a little bit of energy, some of it, which did surprise me. I, I also learned that sort of the basic like existence level for this house is like 400 watts of power, just because things are plugged in. Even if every light is off, it just sort of sits around 400 watts. But you know, charging a phone or turning on a light or something like that basically doesn't make a dent at all. It doesn't show up in the app. Uh, turning on a TV might only take about 100 watts uh, or 0 0.1 kilowatts. A computer can pull three to 500 watts if it's taking a lot of power. Uh, but surprisingly, the big spikes come from the microwave and the toaster, for sure. But the, the two toaster, yeah, the toaster, man. I mean, my, my reaction to this is, is just, I don't have a problem with any of that. I, you're never gonna hear me uh, be negative about that kind of stuff, because I think that's fucking stupid. I, I think that's fucking stupid, but uh, the idea that we need to get solar prices up is batshit crazy. We should be taking, we should be going, oh, it's China giving us cheap solar panels? Thank you. And we should be installing them. We should be mandating their installation. We should be putting them on everything we can hang one on. And we should be getting batteries and we should be installing battery backup, battery grid backup. And we should be taking advantage of this opportunity to set ourselves up so that America has free renewable energy the next 30 years. California has it so every new house that's built needs to have solar panels now. There you go. That's what they should do. All right. We have chat. Norman Finkelstein Israel's on Al Jazeera. On Gaza continue. Norman Finkelstein on Al Jazeera with Mark Lamont Hill. And this is how you get people, chat. I'm excited for this. Two kings. 
Jews, and Israel is facing a case of genocide at the International Court of Justice. But are we at a turning point for Western support of Israel? And what future is there for Gaza and for Palestine more broadly? Earlier, I went to New York to speak to one of the foremost scholars on Israel-Palestine, Norman Finkelstein. Professor Norman Finkelstein, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank, thank you for having me. You've been an advocate for Palestinian freedom mm -hmm. for decades. You devoted much of your life, certainly your scholarship, to this. Uh, you're also the child of Holocaust. Dude, dog, you really think people are going to put a dynamo in their house? Why not? You have all sorts of dumbass shit in your house. You have all sorts of dumbass shit. You have, you have highly explosive gas that flows to like millions of homes. That's insane. We have water heaters. Yeah, exactly. Water heaters. The way they're, by the way, solar water heaters should be everywhere. Survivors. Your parents uh, were in the Warsaw ghettos during the uprising. They were both taken to concentration camps. Your father was even in the Auschwitz death march. How do experiences like this inform your work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I came from a very political home. That was just a fluke of fate. No other people who survived, they weren't steeped in, immersed in passionate about politics my parents how were. can you how can that be how can that be can someone explain to me this the holocaust happened because of politics because the wrong people got into political power in germany and they did the holocaust how do you not experience the holocaust and go how do you experience the holocaust and go i don't care about politics what the fuck how how is this possible Shouldn't you be hyper vigilant? Shouldn't you be obsessed with politics? Shouldn't you be? I mean, it doesn't make sense. People are afraid of solar panels, but have hot water heaters. <laughs> you know what I see? I see a hole in the roof, man. Holy cow. Now that's what I call mission accomplished. I wish you could be here for this kind of explosion because when the hot water here finally blows, you're staring right at it because we know where the zone is. And the thud that comes out of it is so deeply guttural and still warm kind of thud. <laughs> it's great. Watch it again. This is dangerous, chat. Who knew? Piece of skin there. <laughs> Looking at the damage the water heater did to the building, it left some neat holes in the first floor <laughs> and through the roof, which is no big deal. But looking more carefully, you realize what a shock the entire building took. Wow. Yeah, look at how much damage it did to the plywood right here. The cinder blocks that I put underneath the ground floor are actually shattered from the downward push. It actually lifted the entire roof off of its seat and then set it down. You know, this would pretty much ruin your house. You don't say. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the serious shit. Actually, I'm not sure if this is the best way to begin the interview. But my parents had a very turbulent, tormented marriage. I think both of them never really recovered from what happened to them and what happened to their families. On both sides, every member of the family was exterminated. And so it was not a happy marriage. Um, but I remember my mother once saying to me that for all, your, for all the horrors of the marriage, we never disagreed on politics, meaning she and my father. And they had very strange politics by current standards. They were both fanatically pro-Soviet, pro-Russian, because they looked at the world through the lens of the Nazi Holocaust. Mm. And the Soviet Union defeated the Nazis. There's no question about that. 90% uh, of the German troops, the army, they were fighting on the Eastern Front. Um, my parents were fanatical Stalinists. Mm. Long after the Soviet Unbelievably based. The Union had distanced itself from Stalin, the famous speech by Khrushchev in 1956, 
um, my parents would not brook any criticism of Stone hmm. till the, their death, till their last days, their last breaths. Um, and I think there were probably the only two Stalinists left in the <laughs> world. It was very funny when I, even let's say when I was in seventh grade, it was professor, the teacher was Josh Abramson. And we were discussing World War II and I didn't know better. I was defending Stalin and Russia and singing <laughs> their praises. I remember the uh, teacher, Mr. Abramson, he said that you realize how many people Stalin killed? So what do I know in seventh grade? So I went home and I said to my mother, do you realize how many people Stalin killed? And she said, well, Stalin said that this generation is going to suffer, but the next generation will live better. Next day I go up to sc go into school, raise my hand. Stalin said this generation will suffer, but the next generation will live better. So Mr. Abramson says, in other words, you're saying, Mr. Finkelstein, he did call us by our surnames. <laughs> he said, in other words, Mr. Finkelstein, you're saying that the ends justify the means. Well, I didn't have a clue what that meant. But I went home and I said to my mother, in other words, mom, you're saying the ends justify the means. <laughs> Virtual said, debate. Oh, in this case, yes. And I went back and I just repeated. I had the clue what I was talking about, obviously. Um, so you've been riling people up for years. <laughs> well, I wasn't intentionally doing it, but you understand that at that age, you're very influenced by your parents. Yeah. I remember in sixth grade, it was 1964, and it was the presidential election. It was between um, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. And my parents were very, again, 64, before being anti-war was popular. They were very anti the Vietnam War. And I came to class one day and I raised my hand and I said, well, in my opinion, Lyndon Baines, President Johnson is belligerent, okay? The teacher said, sit down, you don't even know what the word means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard you say something like that in interviews before. <laughs> I've been watching you on the internet lately. But let me ask you something, though, because you are a controversial voice, clearly mm -hmm. since middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, you're one Great of, school. I'm correcting you. <laughs> you're one of the leading you know, scholars in the mm -hmm. world on this topic, but you're also one of the most controversial ones. I mean, you've been called, quote, the mm -hmm. foremost Jewish anti-Semite mm -hmm. on planet Earth. <laughs> Some people call you a Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. but why does your world generate these types of responses? Um, I think it's a kind of paradox, to tell you the truth, because as you well know, my actual political opinions are very conventional and well within the mainstream. For example, long after the whole of the left went over to this notion of one state, I was still advocating two states. Yeah. Whereas the whole left was <clears throat> trying to anchor their thinking in things like settler colonialism and this and that, I was very firm in just in repeating what international law said. I, I thought that was the best vocabulary uh, to try to reach a broad audience. So the controversial part comes, I think... It's from, it's from effectiveness. It does, you don't even have to be radical to be called radical if you're disrupting the status quo in any way. From... There's a certain... What is he talking about with the three states for the left? I don't know what you, I don't know what you mean. Element of, I will say, fanaticism to me, which is I read everything and I'm ready to cite chapter and verse and everything. So I don't give my, so to speak, adversaries any wiggle room. He said two states. It's not a kind of debate. No, I go in for the kill. Yes. You're lying. That's not true. That's false. And I <clears throat> am relentless. I know that I'm relentless because I spend, a, I think it's a kind of ideological war. Um, and I'm, I am relentless. I know that, but that's because I do the work. Have you lost faith in those, mm -hmm. in those reference points and those frameworks? I mean, I know you used past tense when you mm -hmm. said, I held on to the, 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 the mm -hmm. two-state idea. Mm -hmm. I believed in international law. Mm -hmm. Do you now no longer have faith that those are effective oh. frameworks for getting a pr practical outcome? Okay, those are two separate questions. Yeah. Um, on the question of international law, obviously it moves very slowly you know, pain, painfully slowly when people are being 
killed in the genocide. And so there's a certain degree of more than impatience. There's a degree of indignation. So, for example, on the car ride over here, I was reading the new International Court of Justice uh, response to South Africa. And it goes on for about 12 pages. And they say, we have to first consider this point. We have to first consider that point. And we have to first consider this, that, and other. All right, come on, guys. Let's just cut to the chase. People are getting killed. People are dying of starvation. But on the other hand, I have to say there's a kind of, I don't know, I was kind of touched by the fact that at the end of the day, the law at a huge price for the people of Gaza, but the law seems to be kicking into place. And for example, right now as we speak, 31% of children under the age of two are facing acute malnutrition in the northern part of Gaza. They went through the evidence and they concluded, no, Israel has got to uh, give, let the food in, you know. It took 12 pages, it took six months, but the law is, you know, kicking in, so... But will I, the food be let in? I mean, we saw after the January yeah, decision, I know. not much changed. I know. And then what do you do? Mm. You know, on the one hand, it's a very... Well, uh, just as an update chat, uh, this morning, we just looked at it before the interview, but this morning, Biden finally pressured Israel into opening up the uh, a northern uh, entry point for aid into northern Gaza. And also, Israel agreed to allow one of its ports to be used for the flow of aid. So the world, uh, the world Central Kitchen was using a jetty that they... makeshift jetty that they had constructed out of rubble. Slow, tedious process. Uh, while... The numbers of uh, since the January 26 decision of the court, uh, 5,000 more people have been killed. So yeah, it's so then, it, so then why do you why why do you have any optimism that mm -hmm. any of this matters? Uh, particularly because I think about in 2020 when you actually mm -hmm. stopped writing on Gaza, mm -hmm. and you said you felt like the work you you were doing was yeah. sort of uh, I think you said pointless and purposeless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, why is it less pointless and purposeless now when we see legal decisions coming out, international mm -hmm. outrage, and yet Israel still remaining fairly obstinate? I guess the simple answer is twofold. Number one, if you do nothing, you can be certain nothing will happen. So that's not an option. And um, the, the second uh, thing is that... There has been a change. There's absolutely been a change. Opposition to APAC, opposition to Israel has become something that is actually part of the conversation in a way that it never was before. We could see the tide turning. We could see the slow shift. And among some generations, it's not so slow and it's not so narrow. It's wide and it's fat and it's growing. We'll see changes. I mean, it's not what you would want, obviously, but you do see change. Okay. The ICG, first of all, the fact that South Africa went to bat for Palestine. Extraordinary. You know, not one Arab state, not one Arab state, it took South Africa, you know? The fact that the vote was 14 to 2. I said, this is impossible before the vote. There, I kept counting. I could only come up with six countries that really? would vote for. Wow. If you, I would have bet every single dollar I owned that it was impossible that the U.S. and Germany would vote yes. Hmm. There are grounds to be optimistic. Not the least, for me, the most optimistic thing is the young people. Hmm. If you had told me that people were going to keep coming out for demonstrations week after week after week after week I, for six months. I would never have believed it. The tenacity, the conviction, you know, it's, it's really an extraordinary sight to behold. You know, somebody said I was at a demonstration three weeks ago. It was at Washington Square Park in Manhattan. 
it was pouring rain. And it was um, a Saturday. And there were about 50,000 people there. And um, they were all around 25. I was an age cohort of one. <laughs> and then there was a gap, literally, there was a gap of 40 years, wow. you know? And then after it was over, a lot of people went down to the subway to go home. And so in the subway platform, on this side of the, tr uh, of the train tracks and then on the other side of the train tracks, everyone's still chanting. Everyone's still chanting. If you know the scenes from the civil rights movement in the United States, yeah. how when they were in jail, they kept singing and they kept chanting and they kept singing and they kept chanting. And it was like these young people, except there's one difference. The people in the civil rights movement were fighting for their own rights. Right. These were young people fighting for Gaza, you know? Two million people Beautiful. in a, some ghetto way off in the Middle East. It's deeply inspiring. No, oh, absolutely. So there's every reason on those grounds, both to be proud of, you know, the capacity of human sympathy Empathy. and solidarity, uh, but also <clears throat> on the grounds of being hopeful. One of the things you talked about was how arguments that were on the margins have shifted at least mm -hmm. to the mainstream to be debated. They're now debatable. Correct. They're engageable. And they no longer can be shot down with you're an anti-Semite. Right. Those days are over. You made an argument recently. And that's that, a, that expansion of the Overton window is so important. And it's why voices like Hassan's, voices like mine, voices like Caroline, voices like Theo, you know, voices like Mafia Jinx, very important. But you get what I'm saying. It's not that each, any individual one of us is that important. It's that all of us together are important. Do you get what I mean? Is that we have changed the conversation away from anybody who criticizes Israel as an anti-Semite to, you know, people having to actually defend what Israel is doing, and they can't. And that is such a significant change that turned some heads, to be sure. Uh, you said uh, that Hamas's October 7th attack was comparable in some ways to Nat Turner's slave revolt, mm -hmm. uh, a rebellion of enslaved oh, of black course. Americans in Virginia that took place Absolutely. in 1831. You've also referred to Gaza frequently as a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of historical comparisons probably aren't in the mainstream yet. Uh, in fact, they offend some people, they outrage some people. Why do you make them? Well, the primary reason I make them is because I think they're true. Now, uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion was replete with the most horrifying Crime. atrocities. Of course. The order Nat Turner, for those of you who don't know, because I don't know what your audience is, uh, the United States had not a lot, but it had slave rebellions before the Civil War. And the best known one and the most famous one was um, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, they killed about 60 people in the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, the order given by Nat Turner, according to the historians, the order was very straightforward. Kill all whites. Yeah. That was the order. Kill all whites. And they proceed to do just that. So when I read that, when I read that, a light went off on in my head and I said, okay, now I have something roughly uh, analogous to October 7th. So now my next challenge is, okay, so how do you render a judgment on the Nat Turner Rebellion? So I figured I would go to the people who were, so to speak, closest to me in my political trajectory, yeah. which would be the abolitionists, those who were um, fighting for the end of slavery. However, they were very strictly against the use of violence. And so I was curious, okay, how did they judge, assess the Nat Turner Rebellion? And so I turned to William Lloyd Garrison. And what would they say? They would say, it's expected. I'm surprised there aren't more. The most famous of the Abolition. abolitionists, he edited the newspaper called The Liberator. And it's very worth reading it, what he said. He began by saying, we told you so. 
because he was speaking to white people. We told you so. We told you, if you keep treating people this way, if you treat them this way, Gonna there's happen. going to be a reaction. And he went on to say that, of course, atrocities, or I think he called it horrors, occurred during the Nat Turner Rebellion. But if you read the statement from start to finish, he never condemned Nat Turner. Hmm. He does not. It's, you know, it was for me an epiphanal moment. Because I spent the last 15 or more years of my life chronicling the horrors in Gaza. The fact that those folks who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th had been born into a concentration camp. Not only were they born into it, but they were living in it and they were destined to die in it, and that was Nat Turner. But is this, a, is this an explanation from a dispassionate scholar who's simply saying, look how inevitable this violence on October mm -hmm. 7th was, or is it an endorsement of the action by saying, look, they had no choice, this is literally the only legitimate well, and morally acceptable option they could make. Uh, look, when you make, when you pass moral judgments, in my opinion, who cares? You have to offer options. What else could they have done? So, when Hamas was elected in two thousand six, well, you've just talked about the international courts, right? So, well, and you have a growing optimism. Yeah. Does that stuff only happen because of the armed resistance? Mm -hmm. In other words, would we have mm -hmm. the world's attention? Would there I would, be? I yeah. would. I'm going to say what the facts tell me. Now, I'm not saying I'm the only person in possession of the facts, yeah. but the facts as they tell me. In 2006, when Hamas was elected, it was elected on a reform platform because the Palestinian Authority is so corrupt, people wanted to change. Yeah. If you study, immediately as they were elected, the international community, first Israel, then the US, then the EU, imposed this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. Now, if you study the record, Hamas was attempting a diplomatic solution to the conflict. It talked about recognizing Israel, two states, having a long-term ceasefire. It made many options. All of it was rebuffed. All of it was rejected. Then, in March 2018, they attempted the Great March of Return, a nonviolent civil resistance. What happened? Well, we know exactly what happened. A UN investigative body produced a report. It was 250 single space pages. According to the report, Israel targeted, deliberately targeted children. Israel deliberately targeted medics. Israel deter deliberately targeted um, journalists. And here's the best one of all. Israel deliberately targeted disabled people, okay? And they have the descriptions in the report. A person in the distance on crutches, 300 meters from the perimeter fence, shot in the head. A person in the wheelchair, 200 meters, shot down. So, of course, the nonviolence is going to fail. If people are just being shot down, like, you know, swatted down like flies, and there's no international reaction, it can't work. The whole premise of nonviolent civil resistance is that if you're willing to incur the suffering, then the international community, or in the case of our own country during the civil rights movement, the North and the federal government will be moved by the violence, moved in sympathy uh, to act. When you show the violence, you remember the whole point of Nonviolence, as uh, Martin Luther King understood it, if you read, for example, the letter from the Birmingham jail, he says that violence is embedded in the system. And all we're doing is we're bringing it to the, the right. surface. They're dramatizing it and putting we're, a spectacle on it. Exactly, in order to evoke sympathy. But does it work but, if everyone's... Oh, well, well, that's it. what I'm going to say. Oh. <laughs> you, you answered, that's the point. It didn't work in Gaza. It didn't work. 
So now you're at the, the heart of the dilemma. If One the thing I wanted to tell, tell you uh, about Nat Turner chat, were you aware of what they did to Nat Turner? After their slave rebellion, you know what they did with Nat Turner? They skinned his corpse. And they turned it into pur purses. They sold his skin as purses. They tanned him and sold him as purses for white slaveholders to give to their wives. They, that is the essence of what slavery represented. Diplomacy didn't work. They tried. I'm not saying what they were saying was perfect. I'm not saying it wouldn't have required, you know, intense. Uh, no, no. In case you want to know what my uh, source for that is, it's this. Nat Turner's skull in my student's purse of skin. This month, Richard Hatcher, a former mayor of Gary, Indiana, delivered what researchers suspect is the skull of Nat Turner, the rebel slave to Turner's descendants. The skull had been kept as a relic, sold and pro probably handed out through generations for nearly 185 years. If DNA tests confirm that the skull is genuine, then Turner's family will have the opportunity to lay their famous relative to rest. With the traffic and trade in human remains for purses, toes, and sexual organs of executed enslaved people to hair and nails of victims of the Holocaust are part of our history. Some Americans were not surprised at all by the news. They might even have some family heirlooms of their own hidden in their homes waiting to be shared with their children. Turner was hanged in Southeast Virginia on November 11th, 1831 for leading a rebellion to slaves that left 55 white people dead. Those who came to witness his death then decapitated and skinned him. They bragged about it for decades. One participant, William Mallory, also known as Buck, gloated so much about having skinned Turner that it was listed in his own obituary. Mr. William Mallory, an old citizen of Southampton County, died a few days ago, immediately after returning from a visit to the city. Mr. Mallory was 80 years of age and figured in the suppression of the Southampton Massacre. He was the identical Buck Mallory who skinned Nat Turner, their leader of the rebellion, and the hide having been tanned, portions of it are now extant in the curiosity shops of many residents in and about Southampton. While in the store of Mr. Ron... John R. Davis in this city a week or two since he remarked that he skinned Nat Turner and he would have skinned old John Brown if he could only have had the opportunity. Nineteenth century newspapers occasionally advertised that a decapitated head had been discovered. Sometimes they were found on trades, left on the side of the road, or impaled on stakes following executions. Vigilantes often took proof in their own mind that justice had been served. They made purses of skin and took the grease from the flesh and used it as oil. These servants' souvenirs were passed out through generations. One student who always sat up front but rarely spoke raised his hand and said he could confirm my research from personal experience. He came from a family of medical doctors four generations deep. His father had a purse made of human flesh. This purse, he explained, was unique in that it was divided into sections of different colored skin, one of which came from a black person. The class was silent.
Samuel Morton, a craneologist, had the largest collection in the world with more than 130 agents making purchases for him on just about every continent. By the late 19th century, he owned more than 1,000 human skulls. Many of them can now be found in the Samuel George Morton collection at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. You know how you talk about how Southern whites are different? Could there be, never be a, a, could there be a no clearer demonstration? Southern white people, man. We're watching this for movie night tonight. You stand for the Lord, the Lord will stand for you. Everybody got God on their side in the war. Trouble is, God ain't telling nobody who he's for. My name is Captain John Brown. We're watching this tonight, Chad. I am here in the name of the great King of Kings. <laughs> the Holy Redeemer, the Man of Trinity. Because he is on the side of justice. And you are on the side of change. Whatever he believed, he believed. Didn't matter if it was true or not. The old man was nuttier than a squirrel turd. For a shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Amen! 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 Stop! Go! Get out! Lunatic. Is what they call a Jayhawker, which is a <clears throat> pro uh, 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 anti slavery guerrilla in Kansas. Basically, people that would go around and kill pro slavery forces. And the Jayhawkers won. Kansas was a free state. Negotiations to make it work, but there were steps taken by Hamas. That didn't That's work. why they're called the Jayhawks? Not oh yeah, you guys didn't know that? The most based mascot... The Kansas City Jayhawks. Jayhawker became synonymous with the people of Kansas during bleeding Kansas period of the 1850s. Jayhacker, Jayhawkers and redlegs are terms that came to promise in the Kansas territory during the bleeding Kansas period of the 1850s. They were adopted by militant bands affiliated with the free state cause during the American Civil War. These gangs were guerrillas who clashed with pro-slavery groups from Missouri known at the time in the Kansas Territory as border ruffians or bushwhackers. So bushwhackers are pro-slavery people. They were called bushwhackers because they would attack from, they would assassinate people from bushes. Literally bushwhack. Everybody calm down. I'm going to give you 10 minutes instead of four hours. Just calm down. The word Jayhawker became synonymous with the people of Kansas or anybody born in Kansas. How many people do you think even know that? So basically the Kansas, the University of Kansas is celebrating anti-slavery guerrilla violence. 
nonviolent civil resistance didn't right. work. You're back. And by the time you got to October 6th, it was clear that a deal was going to be made with Sa the Saudis. And then the whole conflict between Israel and the Arab world would have been resolved above the heads of the people of Gaza. And the only thing those two million people would have to look forward to is to languish and die in that concentration camp. So your, before, your, your critics, so, though, would say there was at least an opportunity for hope or possibility. Now there's 33, almost 33,000 people dead, 8,000 under the rubble, schools destroyed, I, 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 building, almost I'm entire not, built environment yeah, I'm destroyed. Not gonna, I'm not going to defend that. I'm not going to even defend the no, action. No, I, no but what I mean is, ultimately, me, was, it a, was, it a, was it a successful plan? Um, you know, I think, I, I think that politics is a very unpredictable business. So let me give you the analogy and then you can answer me. Yeah. When Nat Turner carries out his rebellion, the immediate reaction was the whites in the South went on a lunatic rampage. They randomly killed about 120 black people just you know, off the street, as you can imagine what happened. Yeah. And then another 80 were killed, uh, died after being convicted in court. So about 200 black people were killed. That was the first consequence. So many a person like yourself would say, was it worth it? 61 white people were killed and now 200 of us were killed. Was it worth it? What was the second thing that happened? The law changed. After Nat Turner, they passed the law, black people can't learn how to read. Because Nat Turner was very literate. I said he knew the Bible and yeah. he was very smart. So they banned, uh, they prohibited teaching a black person to read. Third thing that happened, they prohibited black people from congregating together, okay? Because the people thought he was giving sermons to the black people, and instead it turned out they were plotting the uh, uh, rebellion, okay? So someone like you would say, did that make any sense? Was it worth it? Right. 200 black people were killed, or 30,000 Gazans were killed, uh, the law is now more repressive than ever, okay? So there's an argument there. But then along comes John Brown. And when you read John Brown, he says, I was inspired by Nat Turner, okay? So then you could say, well, John Brown, what did he accomplish? His uh, uprising was put down in, the few, uh, in a, about a couple of days. He was executed, okay? But then along comes Frederick Douglass, and he delivers his famous speech on John Brown, one of his best, in my opinion. And he says, he goes through all the arguments. John Brown was a failure for this reason. John Brown was a failure for that reason. John Brown was a failure for this reason. And John Brown, like, you know, Nat Turner was a religious fanatic, so was John Brown. John Brown was just like Nat Turner. He was convinced he was a vessel of God and slavery was an abomination, which it was, but most people didn't believe it was that degree of abomination right. that you're gonna give your life for it, okay? So along comes uh, Frederick Douglass and he says, you know, there's a straight arrow line from John Brown to the Civil War. Now Turner, John Brown, Civil War. Now, I know I leave out a lot of other factors, yeah. but it was a way station to the Civil War. And now Nat Turner occupies an honored place in American history. Yeah. So I say, I know people won't like it when I say it, but I think it's a question mark how October 7th is going to be regarded. So, in so, the future, if Nat Turner now occupies an honored place, I think it's a question mark. Um, and, and I think part of that will depend on Israel's response and continued mm -hmm. response. I mean, what do you think, given all the destruction, all the death mm -hmm. of people and the physical environment, what do you think Netanyahu's ultimate end game is here? The goal is uh, 
at one end of a spectrum, and the spectrum bleeds into each point, bleeds into each other. At one end is the ethnic cleansing, to just get rid of them, do what they did in 1948, and put an end to this uh, Gaza problem. But is that a realistic vision? I mean, I understand the idea of saying we're going to have civil and governmental mm -hmm. control over Gaza. We're going to maybe reinstall settlements as the pre-2006 mm -hmm. time. I doubt that. Yeah. Right, but but it seems equally doubtful that they could depopulate well, the entire I, I, strip. Okay, let's remember, uh, time moves quickly. The first two weeks, it looked like, or they believed, that they were going to be able to expel the population to the Sinai. But at that point, Egypt made a firm decision, they're not coming in. Yeah. So... One goal was the ethnic cleansing, but I agree with you. After two weeks, it seemed less plausible. No one still might happen. We don't know, you know, the pressures that will be exerted on CC. Uh, number two, the sort of middle position was the one that was advocated by Giora Island, uh, the former head of the National Security Council. He said, we'll give them two choices, stay and starve or leave. In other words, make Gaza uninhabitable. And then the other, the extreme position was to just carry out, you know, a destruction of Amalek to just wipe out the population in a kind of unnuanced uh, genocide. Yeah. So I think those are the three positions and what, what will come of it. What do you think is most likely to come of those um, positions? What's most like, I think, uh, because President Biden is having trouble with that, or a large part of that Democratic base, I think the Gallup polls show that only 19% of Democrats supported what Israel is doing. Yeah. Uh, I think the pressures exerted by uh, Biden will become unbearable for Israel. Uh, and in the United States... Is, could, what, is that, what is that unbearable? It will it be another profiling courage like we saw uh, at the uh, Security Council where they just abstained? No, look, if the United States wanted to stop it, from day one it could have stopped it. You just pick up the phone. By the way, this is something that I've been saying. Go ahead, let your mic was right. Go ahead and let them flow. This is something the left has been saying since October 7th. Since the two or three weeks after October 7th that we said, okay, enough. Enough. All Biden has to do is pick up the photo. We've been saying it time and time and time again. We cited example after example when Reagan did it, when Clinton did it, when Obama did it, we, when Bush did it. But George H.W. Bush did it. We know that the president can say enough is enough. And the reason why it's gone on so long and been so destructive is because Joe Biden has supported it. But now Israel fucked up. They killed some white people. They killed white people with famous friends. And that was too goddamn far. I mean, they murdered people who were good people. I mean, I know I'm calling them white people, but I want you to understand that these were humanitarians who were putting themselves in harm's way to feed starving people. Incredibly brave, incredibly courageous, incredibly good work. These are saintly people, and they were murdered not by one shot, but by three separate shots to make sure they were all dead. It wasn't like a missile went awry and it was an accident. They were intentionally targeted and they had done every single thing that you could plausibly do to ensure that they did not run afoul of the IDF and they were assassinated anyway. Because how dare they feed the scum that is the Gazan people? and say, no more veto, no more weapons, uh, it's over. And it's over. There's no, there's no question about Is that. Is that possible? As a, as, as a practical... Of course it's possible. Of course it's possible. He just says we're not going to do it. I'm not going to bend U.S. law anymore. I'm going to tell the... I'm going to get the thousands of State Department officials that have signed dissent cable, dissent cables. I can talk... There are... If, if Biden wanted to prove that Israel was violating international law, there would be a phone book thick 
of examples and irrefutable evidence that he could present. If Joe Biden said America doesn't support Israel's genocide, if he went on MSNBC and said Israel is supporting a genocide, if he went on CNN and said Israel is supporting a genocide, it would be over. Now, what would, it, what would Netanyahu do? What would APEC do? They would go all in on the Republicans. They would go all in on the Republicans because they would go, okay, this is our only hope to get a Republican in. And Joe Biden would unite the 70% of America who is sane. And he would have the moral majority of people and he would, we would watch the Israeli structure of oppression collapse. And oh, the fire. If Joe Biden would just rally the fight against fascism. But he's a coward. And he's corrupt. And he never would. Would Israel be crazy enough to use their nukes? If Israel were to use their nukes, it would destroy Israel. <laughs> it would destroy Israel. The world would rain fire on Israel because they would have to be stopped. matter given mm -hmm. this special relationship that right. the U.S. has had since the 60s. Well, it's, it's, I, it, it's possible. The question is uh, the political will. And right now, President Biden is balancing the, uh, what they consider to be their security interests. Because, you know, what happened October 7th was a blow for the United States security also. Because the United States has invested a lot in Israel as a regional power and, and able to be a regional arbiter. Let, let me pause you on that for a second, because I spoke the other day to uh, Professor Mearsheimer, mm -hmm. uh, who said that it's a myth that uh, there's still a strategic and tactical interest for the United States to support Israel, mm -hmm. that that may have once been the case, but it's not anymore. Uh, I, look, uh, John Mearsheimer is a good friend of mine. I like him. Uh, <laughs> but? <laughs> we don't agree. I mean, people are, you know, people are uh, in Israel, agree I, I agree. I lean more towards norm. But I want to say, the reason why I lean towards Norm is this. Israel does not actually benefit the United States of America, meaning the citizens and the country of the United States of America. However, having a rogue state that is outside of the United States allows the powers that be, the capitalist class, to use Israel and the Five Eyes intelligence sharing or apparatus. Like, for example, Israel spies on Americans and then shares that information with the American government because it's illegal for the CIA to spy on Americans, right? And Americans spy on Israelis and share that information. That's the Five Eyes uh, intelligence sharing, right? Because the CIA is not allowed to operate with the United States. It can still get information from foreign partners that pick it up, right? Ooh, ooh. They didn't do it, right? And also just, you know, they need to have Israel to do their dirty work in places like Africa to support governments that we don't want to be seen supporting. It's a good cutout for us. And it's a bludgeon to pressure and divide the Middle East because we don't want pan We don't want two things, chat. Pan-Arab nationalism and pan-African nationalism. Okay, because if there was an African unification similar to the European Union, that would be a world power. If there was an Arab unification similar to the European Union, that would be a world power. Okay, so we are we are holding down those people. Okay, we're holding them down by keeping them fractured and divided, just like the logic of having Hamas in the West Bank and Fatah in uh, excuse me Hamas in Gaza Strip and Fatah in the West Bank. We're doing the same thing all over the world, keeping them divided. That's the serve, that's the interest that Israel serves, right? But as far as like, as an American, be a human being, this makes the world so much more unstable. It makes the world so much more dangerous. It, c it causes so many more crimes against humanity. It brings down all of our standard of living. Because if, if there was pan-Arab nationalism, if there was a, a pan-African union, and they were allowed to develop, that would make the world tremendously rich. Look what's happening with China developing. 
We're going to have very cheap electric vehicles and super cheap solar panels. That's already happened. But we're not allowed to get that because it's undermining the status of American or Western so-called capitalists. They don't want to hold China down because China will make the world too prosperous. We can't have that. We got to hold it down because we won't be able to maintain the status quo of extreme deprivation and hierarchy. That's the, that's the fucking plan. It's a big club and you're not in it. Disagree. I, I don't agree on that point. I think the important thing to understand about Israel is Israel is very much like a Western society. It has the same kind of uh, bureaucracy, rationality, uh, modern outlook uh, that makes it very easy for the U.S. to communicate with Israel. And communication is not an, a trivial part. The security people, the intelligence people, they all have the same mental outlook. And so that's an irreplaceable factor for the U.S. to have a, uh, what's sometimes called a stationary aircraft carrier in, in the Middle East, where the whole uh, mental outlook is held in common. Also, it's still by far the most militarily competent. I, I'm, I'm not saying it's great. Um, it took a hit reputationally yeah, as well. It took a very big hit. Yeah, Rep but uh, okay, like mil fighting wars are it's, it's, it's incredibly hard, okay? It's incredibly hard to fight wars. This is something that people who play a lot of video games don't realize. It's really hard to do wars. Reputationally. And I don't think that was an accident. The, the rot has set in in Israeli society. It's become westernized. And that means there's an element of slovenliness to the way they, carry, they conduct themselves. You said you watched um, the debate I had. Yes, with, your, with, your epic almost five-hour debate <laughs> with uh, Moyen well, Rabani and uh, Benny Morris and... And something else. Yeah. <laughs> Destiny. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, and it was striking. something else. At the very end of the debate, I said that Israel now faces a strategic uh, dilemma, a serious strategic dilemma. The dilemma is that a large number of people in the Arab world after October 7th suddenly came to the realization or the epiphany hmm. Israel is not as strong as we thought it was, or Israel is not as invincible as we thought it was. Yeah. And Benny Morris at that point, Professor Morris, very smart guy, he kind of had a nervous laugh. And he said, ah, oh, that's ridiculous. We have atomic bomb. We have nuclear weapons. Right. What was striking to me about that answer was he didn't say we have the IDF, we have the army. He had lost faith in it. Hmm. So now he had to talk about the deterrence of their nuclear weapons. So I don't believe that October 7th was a passing error, mistake, a moment of incompetence. It was a reflection of the fact that Israel no longer is what it once was now of course they're going to flex their muscles though to prove that they actually do have capacity well that's what they're doing now goading perhaps hezbollah uh, obviously we also have the houthis in 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 the red sea who, mm -hmm. with their uh, sea blockade and we also have the hamas issue i mean there's a, there's a there's a thought here that to show that they're yeah, still but, invincible. I, I think that's a very big problem there yeah. i think the problem is that israel has one of its central military concepts is what it calls its deterrence capability. And deterrence capability is just a fancy term for the Arab world's fear of us. And they are very worried now that the Arab world, because of what happened on October 7th, no longer fears them. And so one of the reasons for what's been happening is 
in their language to restore their deterrence capacity. And that does seem to include against Hezbollah. So I think we're very far, very far from the end of what began on October 7th, and it could take forms which will be a regional and maybe a global catastrophe. Professor Finkelstein, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. You're welcome. Pleasure talking to you. What a king. What a fucking king. We need more Dor Norm collabs, definitely. They touched on a lot of fun stuff. That was a really good conversation. It was fun to talk about Nat Turner, John Brown, Jay Hawkers. Like, that was good stuff. It made me, it made me use my brain. And that's what, that's what I like about this stream, is we get to talk about that kind of stuff. Mike, invite Norm on the stream? Sure. Making fun of destiny is always a, is always a W. Ah. <sighs> butler and Jihad has commenced. Honestly, we might need a Butler and Jihad. We might actually need one. All right, chat. Vox put out another video, and it's, I think it's made to piss me off. It's, I think it's built to piss me off. The era of Treep streaming is over. Vox libs. Late last year, I got an email. It said that the price of my Disney Plus annual plan was increasing to $140, but, but that wasn't the only one. Netflix was going up, and their most affordable tier would now have ads. Amazon Prime would be $3 Apple TV month. went from $6.99 to $9.99. a month. There are so many great things to watch, and they're all spread across so many different services. I want to watch them all, but man does it hurt to fork up so much money every month to do it. It kind of makes you wonder, how did we all end up in this position where we're paying so much for streaming every month? And maybe more importantly, can we as consumers do any- uh, The answer is the streaming sites were built off of the same model as Uber. They were loss leaders that were, that were subsidized by uh, financial capital that was infinitely printed in Wall Street. And now they finally have, they're fully developed and they need to start making money. So now it's time to jack the rates. And basically we're just going to reinvent cable TV. Better. That's the end game. We reinvent the cable. To answer these questions, we first need to look at the story from the streamer's perspective. And we'll start with Netflix, the biggest, oldest streamer around. For most of its history, Netflix made money in one way, its subscribers. So if Netflix wanted to make more money, they, they either had to subscribers. add subscribers or raise prices. This was always Netflix's strategy. As this 2021 New York Times article explains, the CEO and founder of Netflix was betting that the company could attract subscribers and raise its prices faster than the debt clock was ticking. And Netflix had taken on a lot of debt, almost $15 billion by well, 2020. Hey, look, my chat, pre-watched, Mike the Precog. As I said, finance capital. With the purpose of building an entire platform's worth of content, ensuring that they weren't reliant on movies and TV that they didn't own, like The Office or Friends. This strategy worked, and for a long you know time- You I missed that used to be on Netflix chat? Star Trek. It makes me want to cancel my Netflix, honestly. I honestly should. What am I doing? I don't watch that shit anymore. The only show that I'm watching on a streamer right now is something I started watching two days ago, which was Shogun. And I watched Andor. Those are like the newest shows I watched on streamers, which is a Disney Plus. So you could get Shogun and Disney and Hulu for like 20 bucks. And it turned out that Vio and I were both spending for Disney Plus. So I canceled my Disney Plus. Yoink. What do I think about Shogun? I'm only one episode in. 
So I don't have a thought yet. But the answer is... I'm on the side of the Jesuits. Kill that heretic. Netflix grew really reliably, even as its prices went up. They'd had very steady growth, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then the pandemic happens in 2020, and they have their best year ever. That's Lucas Shaw, by the way. Managing editor for media and entertainment at Bloomberg News, and I'm also the author of the newsletter Screen Time. Netflix got to a point Get where they realized- Get yourself Condi on a fire stick for educational purposes. Yeah, I used to have a, uh, um, the fuck is it called? I don't care. Never mind. You know, I had access to somebody who who set up a uh, um, Plex server. That's what it was. Pirating. It's so much easier to pirate these days. that their growth was much slower than it had been, right? Growth continues to be slower in 2021 and looking into 2022, they get nervous. And then in 2022, Netflix actually lost subscribers. Just 200,000 at first, and then a million. Honestly, I need to be There are only so many people in the population, right? Even if you got everyone, there is a ceiling to that. But they also knew that they had more customers than it appeared. This phenomenon of password sharing. Netflix had said publicly that they were not worried about it, and I think early on it's true they were not worried about it because password sharing was a way of exposing the service to more people, and if people liked it, they would convert. But at a certain point when they hit a bit of a ceiling, they were looking at the numbers and they said the only way that we're going to be able to grow is if we convert some of those shares into payers. This move created a temporary surge in subscribers. It made enough of a dent that other companies are following in these footsteps. But cool. Netflix is the capitalism. only trendsetter. While all this was going on, another company was carving out a slightly different path. Hulu has always had two tiers to its service, ad-free and ad-supported. According to the 2019 article, Hulu's ad-supported option was the most lucrative tier of their business. It was so successful, they actually lowered the price from $7.99 to $5.99. Advertising has been the key to surprise. a successful video business forever. You know, you think about the cable business, you don't think about paying for a discrete They're channel. They're just literally remaking cable. But you are paying for a bundle of channels, and oh, by the way, those channels still have advertising. So it's not really a foreign concept. That's something that Hulu had done quite effectively. As more streamers crowd the market with ever-increasing prices, Pretty much every service, including Netflix, has introduced a more affordable, ad-supported tier to their offerings, which people seem to appreciate. Ad-supported plans have been driving an increasing percentage of new signups and supplementing each company's bottom line. But here's the thing. Most of these companies still aren't profitable. Part of it is just they're so new. I think we lose sight of that. Like these companies spent billions and billions of dollars to launch new services and take on Netflix. And they tried to con condense, you know, 15 years of Netflix's streaming service into three to five. And that was, that was very expensive. So that's it, more or less. Companies fighting debt, Revenue losses, subscriber losses, or a mix of those things have raised prices and added ads in hopes to become or remain profitable. But what does that mean for us as individuals? Well, if you're like me and have crafted your personality around filmmaking, movies, and TV, then you might be subscribed to a bunch of streaming services indefinitely. Oh. This isn't cheap. But it's the kind of thing that you might be willing to invest in. So maybe the answer for me is to do nothing and just accept the increased monthly cost because I find value in having access to all of the streaming services. Pop but him. in researching Pop this video, him. I found that there is a growing group of people that have a much more strategic approach. They're called serial churners, which is just the industry way of saying that this type of consumer isn't static. They're churning, or unsubscribing and resubscribing to services, based around what they want to watch in a particular month. This According is called being economically rational. The analytics group Antenna, one in five people were serial Honestly, churners in 2023. It seems like the answer for these people is that it's worth the effort to hop around. They can save money and more selectively access content on their own timeline. A more middle ground approach might be to subscribe to one or two services indefinitely and then hop around on the other ones. I've opened Max, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon all within the last month, maybe within the last couple of weeks. And then Paramount- Dude watches a lot of content.
Plus in Peacock, I guess, yes, I'm a churner for those. I, I sign on and off depending on what happens, and that's fine for me. And everyone else, their appetite is going to be different. Maybe other people only want to be permanently signed on for two. This approach requires some effort and strategy around your media diet, but it could be quite cost effective in the long run. Honestly, and that's one weird. of the reasons that we switched from cable to streaming to begin with. The ability to... Stuff like this makes me want to go heavy into physical media. They hate physical media, but it's physical media is also a pain in the ass because then you have to like database. Here's the, here's the disadvantage of physical media, searchability. How do you even know what's in your collection? So that's like, that's why the ultimate is piracy, piracy, intellectual property sucks choose what you pay here's the thing i want to make sure that i pay creators and here's the problem that we have chat if we could cut out these middlemen and just pay creators that would be so superior You wouldn't download a car, would you, Mike? I would download a car in five seconds. I would have an industrial replicator in my garage. Can you imagine how cool that would be? You would just walk down to your garage and just be like, today I want to drive uh, Hassan's Porsche. And it's like, wow. That's the thing. Streaming has changed a lot. We're in a new, weird, increasingly expensive era of it. Maybe that means it's time we start looking at our relationship to streaming differently and start asking the question, how do you make your streaming diet work for you? A quick video on how ridiculous the whole streaming ecosystem is. So you want to watch the 1962 film King Kong vs. Godzilla. Well, don't worry, kid. I'm going to catch you up to speed on every streaming service and how to watch exactly what you want to watch. Netflix. I am subscribed to Netflix because it was a better deal than Blockbuster 24 years ago. For $15 a month, you get Sausage Party, The Pope's Exorcist, Young Sheldon, Old Dads, Bad Moms, Bad Boys, Bad Lieutenant, Bad Santa, Bad Teacher, Bad Tutor, Bad Surgeon, Bad Vegan, Bad Grandpa, Dirty Grandpa, Stupid Boss, Ugly Betty, and Stinky Walter. You get Equalizer 3, Kung Fu Panda 3, and Crudes 1, but Equalizer Equalizer 1 and Crudes 2 are only on Peacock. Equalizer 2 is on Hulu and Kung Fu Panda 1 is on VIX. You get Gray Man, but not Rain Man. So you get the new Spider-Man, but not the first one, which is on Fubo TV. Since Disney owns Marvel, they don't have either. But you can watch the new old Spider-Mans and the old new Spider-Mans and the old old Spider-Mans, except for the newest old Spider-Man, which is only on Stars, which is $10 a month. With Stars, you also get John Wick 4, but not the first three, which have just been added to Netflix. However, Stars does offer you the movie Hitman, which is similar because both characters are assassins. The sequel, Hitman Agent 47, is on HBO Max for $20 a month. Or check out David Fincher's new movie, The Killer, on Netflix which is like watching somebody play the game Hitman. But what if you don't like Hitmans? What if you want to watch Django? Well, I wish you never asked me that because Netflix has the new Django show and they have Django and Django, but they don't have Django or Django, which is coming soon to stars. A few dollars for Django can be rented on Amazon for a few dollars. Django Shoots First is on Plex. Return of Django is available on Tubi and Hallelujah for Django is on Roku. If you love trolls like Leah, Netflix has Trolls Holiday, but not Trolls Holiday in Harmony, which is on Hulu. If you love the first half of Titanic, that's on Crackle, but then you gotta switch over to Voodoo to watch the rest of the movie. Paramount Plus, we had to get to watch Nathan Fielder's new show. Tubi is gonna hook you up with the Fred Trilogy, which is huge. AMC Plus is Halloween 5. MGM Plus is Halloween H2O. If you love the movie Gone Girl, Lifetime Movie Club has a different movie called Gone Mom. They have a lot of mom-type movies on there. Discovery Plus has seasons 1 and 3 of Mythbusters. Discovery Go has season 7 and 12. Crunchyroll has two episodes of Mythbusters and season 14 of Speed Racer for Banania. You'll have to subscribe Subscribe to Funimation now. Dove channel is for dog. I mean, like, honestly, is there a Dove channel? Like, I, I, I'm starting to think this is real. I can't tell if it's fake.
Lucky movies, BritBox has the first 12 minutes of every episode of Diamond Geezer. For Pokemon, there is a website that tells you how to watch this. You start off on Netflix, then swap over to the Pokemon streaming service, which is the only place that has season 2, then swap over to Prime Video for seasons 3 through 5, swap to Freebie, then Hoopla. Season 13 is only on Amazon though, then is swap to real? Tubi. Like, I actually don't know if this is real or not. And Hulu, then Roku channel, and then finally, back to the Pokemon streaming and then Netflix. Easy. Now let's talk content trades. As you know, streaming services only have a temporary license for most of the media they're allowed to stream. This allows competing services to acquire the rights for their library, unless it's original content they produce, like the show Willow, which was deleted entirely. <laughs> Next week, Netflix is trading old dads to ABC iView for Daddy Day. Yeah, why do they delete shows? This is what doesn't make any sense. How much space does a show really take? It can't be that much, right? Like, I don't get it. They deleted, they delete shows and movies. Like, just, th like, what? Ta taxes doesn't explain it. Just do Hollywood accounting. Say you lost money on it. Who gives a fuck? Royally, royalties payment avoidance. To have a royalty, you have to have income. So no income is better than income? What is going on? Amp. Halloween 5 is switching over to Slice, who is selling John Wick Chapter 3 to Jim so that they can afford the rights for Equalizer 2. Good news for hockey fans though this month, Roger NHL Live is finally getting Indiana Jones 4 and 5, but sadly, <laughs> Fetch users will be losing access to the original Puss in Boots movie. Acorn TV is trading Sing 2 to TCM Plus Go, but only if they promise to give Rush Hour 3 to Blaze TV Plus so that they will give Rocky 4 to movie so that they will give Acorn TV Fast 5. By using my simple guide, you now understand how to watch every show and movie, except for King Kong vs. Godzilla because I forgot. HBO Go, which has been rebranded to HBO Now, then HBO Max, and then Max, they have the movie Godzilla vs. Kong, which is a different movie, but thankfully they also have every Godzilla movie produced from 1954 to 1975. Except for King Kong vs. Godzilla, which is not on any streaming services, you have to buy the Blu-ray to watch it. Ugh. All right, chat, listen. I don't know how to explain this, but I, I my vibes have just are are just feel I feel so much better. And it's because I'm seeing stuff like this. And it's been tough. It's been tough to be a leftist. It's been tough since October 7th, you know, October, you know, like September, October of last year was the best my stream ever was doing. And then this war came out of nowhere and it really, it really made people not want to, you know, it really made people hate Joe Biden. Let's just put it that way. Like it was really damaging. But now I can feel the vibes. Apparently the US will not intervene if Iran retaliates. Now, Mighty Jamie, I know that you are a legitimate and calm like a Tom. Thank you for being a king and giving us 10 more subs. We're at 456 subs on the day. Eat that, Golden Kappa hype train. Um... I got into arguments with people November through January. Now it's like, yeah, who was right? Try not to be too much of an asshole about being right. I know that's very rich coming from me. But the best thing to do is to smile kind of painfully and be like, yeah. When people and let people have the space to admit you are wrong without being an asshole about it. Admit they were wrong. It's, uh, you know what I mean? Excuse me. Uh, let people have the space to admit that they were wrong. And, and not be too much of an asshole about it, but be like, you know, hey, you should check out some of the stuff that I'm reading because it's a little bit more reliable. And then you show them democracy now. You show them Jacobin. You show them, you know, some more left-wing things. Maybe, maybe a little bit of the mic from PA stream central underscore committee twitch.tv. 
I'll be normal. I promise. Cosmos 84, and it's stool time. Thank you for the tier one. A blinking red light for Israel and American politics. A shift has come amid rising internal frustration inside the administration about the war. Protesters pray a, during a demonstration in support of Palestinians on Tuesday, April 2nd at Lafayette Park across the street from the White House. Look at how this is being portrayed. In notably blunt terms Thursday, top U.S. officials made a series of warnings to the Israeli government that they were nearly out of patience with its conduct of the war in Gaza. President Joe Biden and his top deputies said they would consider changing their policy toward Israel unless more consideration was given towards the humanitarian crisis its military was producing. A top Biden ally in the Senate argued that aid could be conditioned should Israel follow through on its threat to invade Rafah. That was Chris Coods. Yesterday, chat, when I saw Chris Coods, remember how I told you he was the Biden whisperer? Do you remember that insight I gave you? And I said it was a turning point and it was an important move? Do you guys remember that analysis? And then today, it's in Politico. And this is what I'm saying. Watch me get better analysis than Politico. Even former President Donald Trump went public with his belief that Israel was losing the PR battle. That was something else I covered. <laughs> it's like, this is the shit that I covered. It was a screaming neon side for Israel with respect to American politics, one that made clear just how unnerved policymakers in the U.S. have been by an Israeli strike that killed seven World Central Kitchen aid workers, including an American. And it marked a major shift in an approach toward an ally who, with whom U.S. officials have customarily tried to be in lockstep. That shift has come amid rising internal frustrations among White House officials over the conduct of the war and continued debate among the president's inner circle over the best way to handle deteriorating relations with the Israeli government, especially since Monday's attack. Now, here's the thing you need to understand, chat. And here's, I wanted to show you this because it's absolutely my, I'm trying not to be too much of a shit. I'm trying not to be too much of a shit. But Tommy Vitor, the pod save guy, Richard Haas and Senator Chris Coons now support conditioning aid to Israel. These are moderate centrist establishment figures, not lefty radicals. who are finally recognizing that the war in Gaza is a moral and strategic disaster. Lefty radicals got this right almost immediately. Seems like you should be listening to us more. Mike, don't gloat too much about being right. Also, Mike, well, this is the internet. We get to be gloaty. A Democratic official who has been in touch with the White House aides since the strike said there has been increased private discussions among mid-level and lower-level staff about how the U.S. needs to express its and Biden's anger with the targeting of humanitarian aid workers. A House Democrat who didn't want to run a foul of the White House added that Biden is feeling a ton of pressure from outside of his inner circle. Most of us are fed up, and I think the bottom is going to fall out on support for additional Israel security funding, at least in the Democrat caucus. Yes! Fuck yes! Let's fucking go! And this is something else that I wanted you to, I want to show you because this is a very important point. This is the very important point that you need to understand. The people telling you to give up and that it doesn't matter and there's no point and why are you, you know, go do a grill pill. They're trying to protect the status quo. The people saying, oh, don't pressure Biden. You're going to help Trump. All those people are fucking wrong. And we have been right. We've been morally right. We've been strategically right. We have predicted what was going to happen. And it's starting to work. So never let off the pressure. The fact that they can't get any Muslims to come to the fucking White House for iftar. 
the fact that we did the and we supported the leave it blank the uncommitted the uninstructed that movement is making huge impact it's making people nervous the fact that the uk is already they're frightened chat the UK's government is starting to be afraid that they might be guilty of war crimes themselves. The change in posture has been swift inside the White House. Just 24 hours ago, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby had told reporters that the U.S. government wanted to wait to see the outcome of Israel's review on the deadly strike. But Thursday, Kirby said the U.S. would only give Israel hours and days to outline policy shifts that, absent real changes, there will have to be changes from our side. There you have it, chat. There you fucking have it. Get a journalist job at Politico, watch Central Committee every day, write up an article, immediately send it to your editor as soon as it's relevant, beating all your coworkers and delivering full articles for publishing. Who's looking for a semi-easy job? I, I, I mean, how many people, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but you watch me and then you go and watch other shit content and how much of it is literally just repeating what I say? How many of it, how much of the content that you watch is people going, just saying what I just said? A few hours later. I'm just saying. Uh, and I, and by the way, I'm not calling out Hassan in particular. I think Hassan has his own. Uh, the reason why I like Hassan is because we agree on shit and we have similar forms of analysis. I'm not saying that Hassan is stealing from me or anything. I'm just saying that. When you watch the Central Committee stream, it's like a preview of everybody else's <laughs> coverage. Hours later, Israel opened up the Erez crossing for the first time since Hamas's October 7th attack, which will allow more humanitarian assistance to enter Gaza. Even prior to the death of the world's Central Kitchen aid workers, President Biden had been under increasing pressure to change his posture toward Israel, but so far, he has resisted. Some top-level officials, in particular White House's top Middle East aide, Bre Brett McGurk. Now, let's take a look at Brett McGurk. National Security Advisor under George W. Bush. Mm-hmm. 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 So his family was originally from Pittsburgh. Oh, great. He was the guy who helped do the Iraq invasion and wrote the Constitution of Iraq after we invaded. Cool. A big Bush guy. Council on Foreign Relations. Uh huh. Uh huh.
So he was banging a Wall Street Journal reporter. Uh-huh. And leaking her information. In the announcement, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice stated, Brett McGurk is the consummate professional diplomat. So in other words, he's a conservative and he's a top Biden advisor in foreign policy. Don't you love voting for Democrats and getting Republicans? McGurk's argument has been that major change could weaken any influence the U.S. has to protect civilians in Gaza, secure the release of hostages, and broker diplomatic relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia in a deal that pushes... That's just bullshit. This is all bullshit. <laughs> National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has questioned the need to represent Israel, uh, reprimand Israel and wind the riff with the ally, the people said. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, Defense Secretary Lord Austin, Austin routinely offered advice to President and recently... Ratcheted it up their criticism of Israel. Blinken said Thursday that the uh, world central kitchen attack should at be the last on aid workers. While Austin Wednesday night expressed his outrage at a call with Israeli Defense Minister Yolov Gallant over the strike. Lower down the ranks of the administration, discontent with the approach to Israel has been growing. Josh Paul, who worked with the State Department's Bureau of Political and Military Affairs for more than 11 years before residing over the war in October, said he is in regular touch with several hundred Biden administration officials through group chats and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Oh no, he should not have leaked that. The NSA is going to be monitoring that. My impression of these is that there is an immense amount of frustration at all levels within the system, but there's very little ability to shift anything given that this remains sort of a top-down direction, said Paul. I've had a bunch of people reach out to me and say, I'm thinking about resigning, and this is the last straw. I mean, if they all resigned, that would be good. If they all resigned at once. While Biden and his closest advisors are well aware of the growing dissension throughout the administration, they have not been convinced that weakening Israel's retaliation against Hamas does the ally of the U.S. any long-term favors. Uh-huh. Retaliation against Hamas. That's been true, even as diplomatic resolution of the conflict has proved elusive. A virtual meeting this week between senior U.S. and Israeli officials over a future military operation at Rafah found little common ground. The American side, which included Sullivan and McGurk, said it would, should take Israel approximately four months to safely evacuate the roughly 1.4 million Palestinians in the southern Gaza city. The Israelis countered that it would only take four weeks. You're going to be responsible for the third famine crisis of the 21st century. That is not something we can accept as partners, Sullivan told his Israeli counterparts. If you don't have a proper plan for the day after, nothing will help you dismantle Hamas. Not Rafa, not anything else. In a 30-minute call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday, the president delivered a bluntest warning yet that he was willing to condition USAID. U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action. Wow, it's almost like he could have done that months ago. Senator Chris Coons, we watched that yesterday. At some point, the words become empty, he asserted, noting six months of criticism had done little to change Israel's military tactics. These comments have left the impression that anger with Biden's policy has moved from the progressive and pro-Palestinian wings into the centrist establishment heart of Washington, and they've been endorsed by veterans of past Democratic administrations. The president doesn't get credit for being privately enraged while still refuses to use leverage to stop the Israeli defense forces from killing and starving innocent people, said John Favreau. These stories only make him look weak. All of this stuff that's in this article, I noted. This is just a long Mike was right to end the week. Observers suspect that the mounting pressure on Biden will eventually take its toll and may have already done so. There was always going to be a point at which the Biden administration felt that the domestic and international costs of supporting Israel's campaign in Gaza outweighed the benefit of what Israel was able to achieve on the ground. And it seems clear that we have reached that point, said Michael Singh, a top Middle East official in George W. Bush's White House.
Wow. All right, chat. Well, thank you so much for hanging out. Here's the links. Uh, today is Friday. So every Friday at our Discord at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, we watch a movie together. So make sure you jump in the Discord. Uh, we also uh, have a WoW guild in the Crusaders Strike server alliance side. The Central Committee Guild. We are leveling for... Um, phase 3 just started. If you want to join in. We're, we're, we're recruiting our 20 raiders. If you want to hang out with me a couple times a week playing WoW. Come join in. Have you seen this? The U.S. will not interfere if Iran attacks Israel, according to who? Through a series of messages saved via the third parties, the United States and Iran have come to an understanding. That Iran assured the Americans that it will not target U.S. facilities. In turn, the U.S. said it will not get involved if Iran retaliates against Israel. I don't know about this. I, don't, I, I you know, I don't know about this as, as reliable. Anyway, God, I hope that we can end this escalation because we do not want an internet. We don't want World War III, chat. Well, everybody, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I had a ton of fun. Hope you did too. Um, the, vibes are, the vibes are improving. The vibes are improving. I feel like the pressure is starting to work. Biden is beginning to fold. All right, everybody, I'm going to send you over to VO. Who is apparently going to be revealing a secret. They're also playing Red Dead Redemption 2 for the first time. So if you want to hang out. Uh, Mike, I'm proposing tomorrow. Wish me luck. Good luck. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I'm going to send you over to VO. Good news, hopefully, if we can get this war in Gaza ended and browbeat the Biden administration. I'll see you all at, at movie night tonight. Nine, remember, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, on the Discord. Stay safe out there, and remember, solidarity forever. That's how socialism wins. And of course, free Palestine. All right, everybody. Peace out. See you soon.